In this episode of the Stronger by Science podcast, we discuss advancements in athlete drug testing, research pertaining to protein and overfeeding, a surprising new study on ectosterone supplementation, and which muscle groups are really targeted by the back squat. Then we interview Dr. Eric Helms about all things bodybuilding, and we finally settle the dispute about who truly started the first ever fitness podcast. Thanks for listening and enjoy. Welcome to the Stronger by Science podcast. This is your host, Eric Trexler. I'm here with temporary guest host, Greg Knuckles. Um, now, before we get into the science today, we have some things we should probably address. Don't you think? Yeah. We've always been pretty open and pretty proud about the fact that we're the first uh, fitness podcast. And uh, this week, some allegations came across our desk that... Maybe we are not, in fact, the first uh, podcast in the fitness space. Now, people have been sending us a lot of evidence suggesting that some podcast-like media have been available before our first episode aired, and some of these uh, pieces of media did touch on fitness-related content. Now, some of this evidence that people brought to us is very clearly fabricated. Uh, This is... This is fake news, plain and simple, but it is possible that some of these things are authentic. So I want to start by saying one thing, just like any other religious text, a lot of the things that happen in the Stronger by Science cinematic universe are to be taken literally, and some things need to be interpreted within the context in which they're spoken. Wouldn't you agree? Yeah, for sure. So when we say we were the first fitness podcast, you mentioned this and I thought it was a great point. It is certainly true, but not necessarily factually correct. Right. And that's a really important distinction. Um, But in any case, it takes a really noble person to, um, to assert something that's clearly false. And then when they're forced to acknowledge it, amid just overwhelming evidence to own up to that. Yeah, j- just just to make this as explicit as possible and clear the air, there were absolutely fitness podcasts before ours. However, ours is still the first fitness podcast. And I don't the, know how much... What do you, you can't get more clear than yeah, that. Yeah, that's, that's as clear as I know how to make it. Now, because there were some fitness-related audio... Uh, pieces of content before us uh you gotta admit when you're wrong and so i'm i'm really proud of us but more importantly i'm proud of me for for stepping up and doing the right thing and and so that's where we're gonna leave it yeah okay now there were also allegations that maybe greg and i are mad at omar and eric helms because they started a copycat fitness podcast and i want to be very clear about this so that we nip this rumor in the bud We are furious. We're really upset with them. And if you're listening, and we know you are because you're going to need content next week, Omar, Eric, you're on notice. And it's gone on long enough and it stops now. Now, if you're listening, you probably saw the the title of this episode and noticed we are, in fact, interviewing Eric Helms this episode. That does not mean that we're cool at all. So if you watch the news, you saw... This week, uh, Donald J. Trump met with Kim Jong-un in the demilitarized zone. And that's kind of how we see this. You know, sometimes in history, you have to meet and and talk with these despicable characters for the betterment of the whole world. And that's how we view our conversation with Helms. We don't want to talk to him. We didn't like doing it at the time, but um, it's important. Yeah, our, uh, our our national security advisor um, advised us that we shouldn't negotiate with terrorists and rogue states. Um, but there's there's so much tension in the air in the fitness industry between us and Omar and Eric. We thought that we would be the bigger people here and, you know, take the opportunity to attempt to clear the air since they're obviously you know, poor actors acting in bad faith, it's probably going to go poorly. It's probably going to make relationships deteriorate even further. But, you know, it's at least worth a shot. It is. And before we move on to the content, one last thing to clarify. Uh, 
while we mentioned that we were the first ever fitness podcast, we also mentioned that the FDA uh, rapidly made a, a, a press release about CBD right after we aired our episode about CBD. We suggested that the FDA was responding directly to us in a prompt manner. And we very much stand by that. We do believe that that federal agencies are listening and, and kind of responding when when we ask them to. So again, if you have any federal policies that you want changed or at least clarified, be sure to send them to us and we will uh, mention them on the show. Are we good, Greg? Yes, sir. I think we cleared it up. I don't know how much more clear we can make it. So that, sh- that should do it. Now, we have a podcast, uh, a segment on the podcast called Feats of Strength. It's a fan favorite. Greg, what did you find this week? So, the last time we left off with Feats of Strength, it was currently in the middle of IPF World Championships. Um, that will give you an idea of how much lag time there is between <laughs> when we record these episodes and when they air. But, uh, but yeah, so more news from the IPF World Championships, just for people who weren't keeping tabs on them. Uh, Russell Ori. Um, broke the IPF world record total in the 83 kilo class, uh, totaled 833 kilos, which is a tremendous number of pounds, uh, also broke the squat world record in the process. And, um, for my money, that was, that was definitely one of the most impressive performances of the entire meet. The 83 kilo class has been stacked for years now. Um, you had John Hack before he left the USAPL, you had, um, Brett Gibbs. So, you know, two very, very good lifters have previously held the world record. Uh, Russell Ori raising the bar, still very young, still probably going to improve on that record in the years to come. Uh, very, very impressive performance on the women's side of things. Amanda Lawrence. So if you follow powerlifting on Instagram at all, you've probably seen Amanda Lawrence pop up in your, uh, like on your Instagram feed. She is incredibly strong, um, squatting mid to high fives regularly in training. Um, she took the IPF world record squat with 243 kilos, which is 535 pounds in the 84 kilo class. Um, which, like, for context, the world record squat in the next weight class down, which is also very impressive, I believe is 202 or 203 kilos from Isabella von Weisenberg. Um, so that just gives you kind of context for how impressive 243 or 535 is um, in the 84 kilo class. She's tremendously strong. You can watch the video of that squat. Didn't even look that hard, honestly. So, um, currently I'm pretty sure Benika Brown is still, uh, the only 600 pound squatter in drug tested female powerlifting, but I could see Amanda Lawrence joining those ranks within the next year or two in the 84 kilo class versus the supers. Very, very impressive lift. Um, sticking with squats, uh, Alexi Nikulin, untested lifter out of Russia, 83 kilo guy uh (laughs) he squatted um 360 kilos which is 794 pounds uh at 83 kilos or 183 pounds which like that's just absolutely bonkers to be clear it was a gym lift but he currently holds the world record i believe at 345 kilos so he's proven that he can hit huge lifts on the platform before wouldn't it be shot and and also i don't think i mentioned this that was without knee wraps too so it's a raw almost 800 pound squat and body weight of the 180s yeah for for my money nikulin is probably the most impressive uh untested squatter on the planet right now like that's that's an absolutely outrageous lift um, so yeah, we, we very well could see, uh, an 800 plus pound raw squat without knee wraps in that weight class in the next year or two, um, which would just be absolutely wild. Um, further sticking with squats. So 
if you guys haven't picked up on this yet, I really like squats, my favorite lift. Uh, so that's what I focus on. CC Ingram, also a gym lift here. Um, she competes in both the 72 uh, and 84 kilo classes, I believe. Um, I think she's she's closer to the 84 kilo end of end of that range now. Uh, but she squatted 645 or 293 kilos. Um, again, that was a gym lift that is higher than her current world record. Um, incredibly impressive lift. There's so I it seems like on the untested female side of things, a lot of the lightweight women tend to get most of the attention. But in on like the middleweight slash heavyweight side of things, CC Ingram is just she's a machine and she's really in a class of her own right now. And that's a just unbelievably impressive lift. Um, moving back to the IPF, Owen Hubbard benched uh, 215.5 kilos, which is very close to 500 pounds in the 83 kilo class, I believe. Um yeah, yeah, that was at 83, which, again, new world record, outrageously impressive. Um, e even in the 105 class, if you're benching anywhere close to five, that's very much a world-class bench. So hitting that at 83, super, super impressive. Uh, <laughs> I kind of feel like the feats of strength thus far have just been kind of an ode to the 83 kilo class, but... I mean, there, there's a lot of strong 83 kilo lifters. So what Nothing can I say? Nothing can do about it. Uh, switching gears. Some of the feedback we've gotten is that our feats of strength have been very powerlifting focused so far. I will admit that's my bias. Uh, I am a powerlifter, haven't competed in any other strength sports. Um, but there are weightlifters and strongmen uh, who listen to this podcast. So, you know, for the sake of e ecum ecumenicalism, is that the proper conjugation? Whatever. Doesn't Never matter. Never heard that term in my life. Um, CJ Cummings uh, broke the junior world record, the junior and senior Pan American records, and the junior and senior American records um, at uh, Junior Pan Ams recently. He um, snatched 154 and clean and jerked 193, which... I forget how old CJ is now. He's either, I think he's either 16 or 17. Um, but like for, for people listening to this podcast who are not from America, I don't think you fully understand how, uh, how blue balled the U S is when it comes to weightlifting and men winning medals. Um, a U.S. male hasn't won, uh, Olympic medal in weightlifting in decades. So CJ is a rising star. I mean, he's already a star. He won junior Pan Ams. He broke the senior Pan Am record. Still a teenager, still improving. Um, probably doesn't really have a real shot at winning gold in 2020, but definitely seems like he's strong enough to be in medal contention. Um, probably for the bronze, possibly for the silver. Uh, incredibly impressive lifter, improves year over year, meet over meet very consistently, still young, still going up, super, super strong guy. Um, and then moving on to the world of strongman, um, if, <laughs> if you watch World Strongest Man on like ESPN when it airs like six months after the actual contest, uh, skip ahead about three minutes um, because this is going to be a spoiler. If you didn't know, World's Strongest Man is recorded multiple months before it's actually aired on TV. But the reigning world champion, Hapthor Bjornsson, was taken down by Martins Litsis, um, which I think a lot of people are happy about. I think more people would have been happy about it if it was under kind of... I won't, I won't say like fair circumstances because like injuries happen, but under, I guess, like more equitable circumstances, Thor tore his planter fascia, I believe, on the first day of the finals, um, still kept competing, still did well, 
uh, but he was hobbled a little bit. So, like, no one is putting an asterisk by this win for Lietzis, Um Because, I mean, strongman is a fairly dangerous sport, even in the context of strength sports. And people do get injured while competing all the time. Um, but, yeah, he M- Martins looked really good, really strong. Um, definitely seems like he, he would have still been competitive with Thor had Thor been healthy. And... A lot of people are just really happy about this because he's a he's a fan favorite. Leitzis is. Um, if you don't know who this guy is, check out his YouTube channel. Like, dude, just seems like just a super chill bro. Like, big goofball doesn't take himself too seriously. Just seems like a really nice, genuine guy. Incredibly strong dude. Uh, bringing bringing the gold home to America, which again, as an American, making this podcast makes me happy. Uh, first since Phil Fister. Yep. Recording on the 3rd of July, no less. Correct. Correct. Um, so, yeah. Uh, congratulations to Martins. Um, really, really big win for him. And, you know, honestly, I think it makes the sport of strongman more exciting moving forward. Because for the past year or two, man, it looked like Thor just had a stranglehold on the sport. Um and like I said, like Brian Shaw has been a champion before, still very good, kind of seems like he might be on the downslide. Uh, Thor is still relatively young as well. So I think a lot of people are kind of buckling in for, well, OK, this dude just owns the sport for the next five or six years. So having another very, very top flight strongman like Leitzis, um take the world's strongest man title, you know, still improving looks like the two of them are going to have a lot of really really exciting head-to-head battles in the coming years really really good for the sport a lot of people are really happy about it uh and then on the female strongman side of things rihanna and lovelace uh deadlifted 260 kilos in i I saw conflicting reports about this she competes in the 64 kilo class I think I saw someone say that she missed weight for the competition and weighed in at 65. Um, But regardless, so one of the things a lot of people don't know about Strongman, uh, if you haven't competed in Strongman, is Strongman doesn't allow sumo deadlifts, which I think is kind of funny because (laughs) Strongman allows pretty much everything else. Um, Like a lot of of powerlifting purists get upset at Strongman because like, you know, they use specialty bars, they allow straps, they allow deadlift suits, uh, depending on the event and how it's set up and whatnot. But it, it's they allow hitching like it's much more everything goes than powerlifting for the most part, except that they have like a hard rule against sumo deadlifts. So one of the things that I think most people who follow strength sports have noticed is there are a lot of incredibly strong lightweight female deadlifters but basically all of them that i'm aware of pull sumo so uh rianon lovelace her deadlift was conventional because she competes in strongman or strong woman in this case 260 kilos that's like 570 something um and that that's the heaviest conventional deadlift that i've heard of for any woman in any sport around that body weight. So new world record for her, super, super impressive. Um, and yeah, that uh, that wraps up my feats of strength. Now, feats of strength usually basically serves as like an update of the news when it comes to the strength and power world. And this week there was also some news uh, that, that wasn't a feat of strength, but is still quite relevant. Uh, do you want to give us an update on that? Yeah, so um, it came out that Kelly Branton failed a drug test. So if you don't follow IPF powerlifting, Kelly Branton is probably the second best, and if not second best, definitely top three um, super heavyweight powerlifter uh, raw competing in the IPF. Um, would probably be like a perennial champion were it not for Ray Williams essentially being God. Um, but yeah, it came out that Kelly Branton failed a drug test that sent a lot of shockwaves through the powerlifting community. Um, 
So we but what exactly? What all did he get popped for? Yeah. So so here's the deal, and we're we we don't specifically want to talk about Kelly all that much. Um, you know, I don't know that he's filed an appeal yet. I don't know that there's been an investigation. So we don't necessarily want to jump to conclusions. We're we're go, we're going to use this as a framing device to talk about drug testing generally. Yeah. Uh, but I will say things don't look great for him. Um, so he tested positive for D-ball metabolites, Winstraw metabolites, a growth hormone secretagog, and two different SARMs. And that definitely doesn't look great, primarily because those are five of the things that someone would take were they trying to beat a drug test. Um, they all have pretty short half-lives. They're the type of things that someone would take if they were planning on using drugs and then cycling off for, for a competition. Um, so again, until everything comes out, don't want to accuse him of trying to get away with something untowards, but certainly the way things look now, not great. Yeah, objectively speaking, it's going to be an uphill battle when he goes to appeal if he chooses to go that route. Yeah. Yeah. So with with that being used as a framing device, uh, do you want to do you want to hop in talk about drug testing or Yeah, I mean, this is something we've talked about a little bit in the past. Um, you know, whenever anyone fails a drug test, a lot of times you hear the conversation goes toward tainted supplements, you know, so on a previous episode, we had Rick Collins on, and he's a, a lawyer who has represented um, both athletes and non-athletes in the process of appealing uh, failed drug tests. And, um, you know, he talked about how there was a, a case where somebody in the after hours at a supplement uh, packaging facility was going in and spiking the supplement with Clen, uh, with Clen Buterol. Um, and he was involved in a, in a case involving that. He's also been involved in cases where uh, athletes genuinely have taken supplements. They have retained uh, the leftover, uh, like a, an, an extra dose or two of that supplement. They send it off and it turns out, yeah, that, that supplement actually did contain an unlisted banned ingredient. Um, now, we talked about in a previous podcast, a study showing that <laughs> there are all these anabolics uh, on the pro-hormone market that, you know, that they, the FDA sent out all these letters and, and the companies three years later still still had just, basically just as many drugs in these pro-hormones. But these were things that were marketed so clearly to be anabolics. You just couldn't miss it. Um, yeah. I found we, a, we, we came across a product today called Trainbalon, which <laughs> like I, I'm not saying that Trainbalon is spiked with stuff, but like you can't name a product more cunningly to make people think that it's trend balloon. Right. And I'm yeah. just saying if you're taking a product with a name like that and it turns out it does actually have shit in it, you really only have yourself to blame. Yeah. Now you you one of the new things on the block is SARMs. And I actually came across this paper today by uh Van Wagner et al. published in 2017 in the Journal of the American Medical Association. And they looked at a bunch of products that they bought online that were being marketed as SARMs. And they looked at uh, 44 products. They found that only 52% of them contained SARMs. Uh, another 39% contained some unapproved drug. 25% um, of them had substances that weren't listed on the label. 9% had no active substance at all. Um, and 59% had amounts of ingredients that were totally mislabeled. So um, when you start venturing down that road of supplements that are like clearly either claiming to be SARMs or like three letters off from the name of an anabolic compound, <laughs> you, you genuinely have absolutely no idea what you're going to get in that. Yeah. So really your best bet is just to take... I mean, your best bet is probably not to take supplements at all. Right. But if you do take them... Um, look to make sure that it, that it's been specifically approved by WADA. Um, cause like th there is a testing program, like there are approved manufacturers and approved supplements out there. Um, 
they're oftentimes more expensive because they have to pay for that like certification pro- process. Um, but yeah, if you if you really want to make sure that you're not going to get popped for unlabeled stuff, because um, that that is the common claim a lot of people will make when they do fail a test. Uh, if you if that is something that that you're concerned about, make sure you take stuff that WADA has specifically approved. And like Eric said, if you take stuff that they haven't approved, don't throw out the bottle. Um, save it, save a few doses. So then, like, if you have nothing left of the supplement you took, you piss hot, and you say, oh, it must have been a tainted supplement, they're not going to care during the appeals process if you can't prove that it was tainted. Um, you know, they have evidence that you had something in your system and the onus isn't on them to prove that it was, you know, anabolics or stimulants that you were illicitly taking. The onus is on you to prove that it was something that you didn't think had those substances that you were accidentally taking. So, and, and one really key point there is if you can keep at least a couple doses, but also keep the original bottle. Yeah. Because they're going to want to look at the lot number. Because if you can say, hey, like, let's say you, you piss hot for clenbuterol. If you just give them some clenbuterol, <laughs> they're not going to be like, oh, well, that solves it. <laughs> yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. So, like, if you give them an open bottle and have no idea what the lot number was, they might be like, how do we know you didn't spike your supplement with clenbuterol? Yeah, so, for sure. So, what you what would be ideal is if you say, my extra sample was hot for that. Mm-hmm. And if you get another unopened product from that lot number, it mm-hmm. will also contain it. Yeah. That's huge. So in, in powerlifting, that's actually what saved uh, Darrington Wright um, about a year ago or so. So uh, Darrington was kind of a rising star in the USAPL. Um, he pissed hot, I believe, for a banned uh, stimulant. And he said, oh, it was because, you know, it, it must have been unlabeled on the pre-workout that I was taking. And... Oftentimes, people's knee-jerk reaction when someone makes that defense is like, yeah, sure. Like, you know, you were just trying to get away with something. Um, but yeah, he he did prove his innocence. He did still have the pre-workout he was taking. Um, USADA tested that, tested another like batch of that from the same lot. It also had the banned substance in it. Uh, to be clear, he did still get a ban. It's like the onus is on you to know what you're putting in your body. Um, So even if you accidentally take something that's banned, like even if it's an accident, you are still going to serve a ban. But he got his ban reduced from, or he got his suspension reduced from four years to one because he could prove his innocence. Not innocent of having the drug in his system, but innocent of, you know, he he could show that he wasn't intentionally taking it. there are uh, there are some some other wild and wacky ways that someone could contest their innocence, though. So the uh, <laughs> the most common defense is, oh, it must have been a tainted supplement. Um, but there are there are some some other interesting arguments that people have made before. So, for example, uh, a couple years ago when the U.S. team was going over to compete in China um, for world championships in some event. I forget what it was. Uh, Or, you know, maybe it was even the Beijing Olympics. I don't remember all of the details. But I remember that uh, either WADA or USADA put out a press release um, targeted at the athletes saying, don't eat the pork. And they were saying, don't eat the pork because they had tested it so like i think an athlete had previously tested positive for clenbuterol and they said well i didn't take clenbuterol like maybe they were just putting it in the animal feed and everyone was like yeah sure fat chance they tested the pork that like was being sold in restaurants and on the street in china and they found like oh shit lo and behold this does actually have enough clenbuterol still still in the flesh of these pigs that someone could theoretically fail a drug test for it um so so that's a possibility um and another 
another case I heard of, and I, I forget how this turned out, um, but I've heard people make similar allegations before. So there was a female, either weightlifter or crossfitter, I can't remember for sure, but basically her boyfriend was jealous and thought that she was getting too close to her male coach. And so, like, he wanted to get her out of the sport because he was a jealous asshole and, you know, thought that she might be about to leave him, wanted to spend more time with her, whatever, um, and, like, slipped banned anabolics into, like, her water bottle. And then when she, or food or something like that, and then when she tested positive, she was like, oh, shit, like, I have no idea how this happened. And everyone you know, knee-jerk response was, yeah, sure. Like, you were just trying to beat the test. But then, like, maybe, like, a couple weeks later, her boyfriend admitted to it. Like, yeah, like, whatever. Like, now you have evidence. You're still going to get banned for a year or two. So now you got to come back to me. And I'm pretty sure she left his ass. Um, I like, hope so. <laughs> <laughs> but, like, that that is that is a possibility as well. And, and there are rumors of stuff like that happening happening in track and field as well like yeah rival countries like trying to sabotage each other um by like trying to slip ban stuff and into the other team's food or drink so yeah i mean it's it's a wild and wacky world most of the time appeals don't go particularly well um and just one final note about drug testing is I often hear people say that, like, a drug test is just an IQ test, and it's super easy to beat drug tests, and everyone is doing it. The thing is, though, I think a lot of that stems from the fallout of the Lance Armstrong case, and I think what a lot of people don't realize is drug testing now is fundamentally different than drug testing in the 90s or early 2000s. So one is just detection methods have gotten a lot better. So now we have biological passport. So it's not just, you know, testing levels of certain substances in your blood or urine. It's establishing a baseline for an athlete and being able to more sensitively tell, like, what is the typical level of fluctuations of these metabolites in this particular athlete's blood? So... Before, when it was just like a general range for all individuals, it was a little more lenient because different people have different fluctuating levels of hormones and different metabolites in their system. So the levels at which something would be considered an adverse analytical finding were set pretty high just to make sure that there weren't people who were outliers that got shafted. Um, but biological passport um, helps things be more sensitive for the individual for testing for androgens and steroids specifically, uh, and, and primarily here testosterone, uh, carbon isotope ratio testing is huge. Before, it was just based on testosterone to epitestosterone ratio. Those tests were notoriously easy to pass um, for people with a decent microdosing regimen. Carbon isotope ratio testing is substantially more sensitive than those tests were because it's not just looking at the levels of testosterone in your blood um, and like the ratio of testosterone to some other hormone. It's actually able to tell whether it was endogenously or exogenously produced based on carbon isotope ratios. So the cholesterol backbone that steroid hormones are built on um, they have different ratios of carbon 12 and carbon 13 and all of the hormones that your body produces endogenously are going to have the same ratio of carbon 12 to carbon 13 whereas uh, exogenous hormones you put in your body mostly manufactured in soy plants i believe and um it just has a different ratio of carbon 12 to carbon 13 so those tests are considerably more sensitive um, and much, much harder to beat and also just have a longer de de uh, detection window. Um, and then another thing a lot of people don't realize is, so a, a common strategy that people would use to try to take stuff and beat test is 
taking stuff with short half-lives and then just cycling off a couple weeks out from uh, a competition so you'd be able to pee clean in competition. So in 2014, the metabolite tests for a lot of the hormones that people would rely on for beating tests, so primarily here I'm thinking oral terenobol and winstrol, um, those tests got way, way, way more sensitive such that the uh, the detection window went from being like a week to like two or three months. And so um, if you were following weightlifting, say in 2014, 2015, you probably remember the wave of athletes that got popped on retests. So there are a couple weight classes from like the 2008 and 2012 Olympics where on retests, like the top three or four finishers in the weight class all got popped. And now like the fourth place guy has the gold medal or something like that. Um, like it, it was an absolute fucking bloodbath. And, <laughs> and, and that was why like everyone who failed on retests, it was either Winstrol or Earl or oral terenobol. Um, cause people were using methods of cycling off that worked in 2008 and 2012 that no longer worked when the test got better in 2014. And since WADA saved samples for 10 years, um, like they got popped. Yeah, like, so they're just a bunch of really anxious people sitting around going like, well, I'll keep an eye on my phone. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah, pretty much. Um, and yeah, I, I think, I think the, the aspect of, of, uh, WADA drug testing that a lot of people like fail to appreciate just how good it is, is the fact that they save B samples for 10 years. Um, cause like the, there's the common trope that like the cheaters are always ahead of the testers. And like, that's probably true. Like there's, there are probably methods that people are currently using to beat tests that I don't know about and that no one listening to this podcast would know about. Um, like I, I, I'm very open to the idea that those things are out there. But, you know, the, the question is, like, a decade's a long-ass time. Like, is WADA going to figure out about those methods in the next 10 years to then be able to retest samples? And, like, yeah, 10 years is a long time when it comes to anti-doping. So, like... Uh, you you never you never really know who did it the right way until ten years after the fact, which is kind of depressing. Um, but but yeah, like drug testing has in the past roughly five years or so gotten way way better than it was during the time when Lance Armstrong was winning all of his Tour de France's. So it's it a common argument I'll hear is like oh like it's so easy to beat these drug tests. Just look how many times Lance Armstrong was tested and got away with it. The drug tests that he was going through are fundamentally different than the drug tests that people go through now. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to to put that out there because there there is there is a lot of ignorance about drug testing, and I think people fail to appreciate how good modern testing is. I, I think a testament to that is is the fucking Sochi Olympics. You have Russia, which is like notorious for for beating drug tests um, and has had a doping program for a long time. They wanted their athletes to be able to get an advantage over the competition in the Sochi Olympics, still be able to use stuff, not get popped. And like, what strategies do they have to use to beat the tests? Well, they didn't rely on biochemists to do it. They relied on FSB agents literally passing piss cups through a hole in a wall cut behind a uh, a bookshelf. Uh, I mean, that's... I think that's an extreme testament to just how good modern anti-doping is. Like, they were doing the tests in a Russian lab, like, they're in Russia, and the best strategy they can come up with to beat the tests is literally passing cups of piss through a hole in a wall. Um, so, yeah, like... Again, just wanted to get that out there. Modern testing is quite good, and I think people fail to appreciate just how much better it is than uh, than it, than its battered history would suggest. Yeah, and so um, 
our podcast is both loved and hated for the heavy dose of sarcasm that comes with it. So on a serious note, I just want to reiterate, uh, you know, we don't assert any opinion about any individual failed drug test. Uh, we started the conversation with kind of a news update on that. But, you know, it, it, we'll let that situation play out. You know, maybe he has a su- successful appeal, maybe not. Who knows? But uh, nonetheless, it's a good jumping off point for an interesting discussion about drug testing in general. Yeah. You know, let's uh, let's loop back to this. Mm-hmm. Uh, let, let's let's hop ahead to the research roundup because you okay. ha- you have some some really interesting stuff to I discuss some, here. Some very hot takes. Yeah. So have we done a research roundup yet? I don't think we have. So we, we've done some in detail research reviews where we like really dissect a paper for a while. Um, this is something we call research roundup, where it's it's kind of the cliff notes version. If we like see a few interesting papers that we don't want to spend 10, 15 minutes on, it's just a nice way to kind of give people an update of some new studies that have hit the press. So um, I saw a nice little cluster of studies that came out uh, over the last month or two. And I'd say about a year ago, there was a, a big lively debate about overfeeding with really high protein diets Mm -hmm. and a lot of people were noticing based on some studies like oh it looks like really high amounts of protein don't seem to be making people particularly fat they don't seem to be gaining a lot of fat mass Um, now a lot of these studies showing this were um, they had a great deal of ecological validity Um, they were free living people and they just said hey eat a ton of protein uh, but the problem was they weren't particularly well controlled. And, and that's kind of the um, the give and take in research is the more you put it into real life, the more you have to sacrifice laboratory controls. So the question was, is there something going on there? If you overfeed protein, will you get fat? Or on the flip side, if you're cutting, do you have to limit your protein or can you just, you know, set your protein super high and be nice and full and happy your whole diet? So that's the question, and it was one of those things where these very applied studies with free-living people, I was just super skeptical of the outcomes, because like, believe me, I've dieted, and uh, I've dieted more than anyone would want to, I'll put it that way. And if I could have been getting away with super high protein the entire time, I feel like I would have known that. Um, I mean, there comes a time in the diet where it's just the calories have to have to go. You know what I mean? You can't just give yourself unlimited protein. So it's just it, more importantly, academically, where is the energy going? You know, we're, we're putting it into the system. Mm-hmm. The question is, unless you have some kind of terrible malabsorption disorder, it, it's got to go somewhere, you know? So there's a few studies that came out recently that kind of help shed light on this topic in general. So one is by, who? how do you think you pronounce that, Greg? I sure, have no idea. Mel? Sure. I, I assume it's French. It, very French. Yeah. Charidamu. We're going to call it that. Oh, man. I, th- yeah, whatever. We're filthy it's Americans. Fine. We apologize. Yeah, that's r- absolute tragic mispronunciation. But anyway, so uh, this paper came out and it was a really cool study. They did a uh, crossover design where they gave pretty realistic mixed meals. Uh, since it's French, it's probably just pronounced sh. Sure. Yeah, that sounds good. Uh, But they gave mixed (laughs) meals of varying macronutrient composition, about 500 calorie meals. So those are realistically sized meals. And uh, what this study showed uh, was evidence that high protein feeding does induce some degree of de novo lipogenesis. So, um, you know, this idea that you couldn't, like that it would be literally impossible to gain fat from protein overfeeding this provided some mechanistic insight by which the pathways are are elucidated. Another thing they did in the study was they actually did it like a little second experiment that was in vitro in which they identified that um, they found evidence in vitro of de novo lipogenesis with, uh, with glutamate, glutamine, and leucine, but not with lysine. Um, so, you know, I don't want to dive super deep into that paper since it's research roundup, but... In any case, they make a pretty a pretty solid uh, case for the idea that theoretically de novo lipogenesis would be doable with a high protein intake. Now, to be clear, we're talking about finding 
essentially biochemical evidence. Yeah. What what was what was kind of the magnitude here? Like is was minimal. It... Minimal. Okay. Yeah. Okay. But in, in any case, you know, a lot of people, even with carbohydrate, they say, "Oh, it's impossible. It never happens." But at least it's a thing that could happen. You know, a lot of people say, "High protein diet, knock yourself out. What could possibly go wrong?" Obviously, certain amino acids are glucogenic, others are ketogenic, and theoretically, you could be creating some lipid in the process. So, um, again, you know, without getting way down into the weeds on the details of the study, an interesting finding that pertains to the concept of protein overfeeding yeah. and would suggest that theoretically, especially over the course of several meals throughout the day, could it be relevant? Maybe. But what what they show here are just biochemical clues that mm -hmm. de novo lipogenesis did occur which yeah. is pretty fascinating i think um now the other and studies just one other thing i'll note is for de novo lipogenesis studies and, and primarily here i'm thinking about the carbohydrate studies um it, it's it's hard to pick that up if it's just like cross-sectional work feeding one meal um some of the some of the studies that have looked at de novo lipogenesis after carbohydrate feeding find that with like one meal of massive carbohydrate overfeeding, you get virtually no de novo lipogenesis. But then if you keep fat intake low and keep carbohydrate intake really high, basically de novo lipogenesis gets progressively more efficient over time. Um, basically, just because it becomes more required for things to met to function metabolically the way they should um like you you need fatty acids floating around you don't want crazy high levels of glucose in your blood all the time um so it, it wouldn't shock me if a similar thing applied to protein where you know maybe in general you get no or very minimal de novo lipogenesis from protein overfeeding but like you said now we have direct evidence that it is at least possible yeah and so you know if you had super low fat intakes and really high protein intakes it may be that de novo lipogenesis from protein got more and more efficient over time yeah yeah again i i don't think you know the purpose of bringing up this study is not like guess what, you know, that chicken breast you just had just turned into fat and it's sitting on your love handles. Um, but again, when people talk about these protein overfeeding studies and, you know, is it even possible that they could contribute to fat gain? Um, this is a little extra piece of evidence uh, kind of elucidating exactly what can happen to protein when it is overfed. Yeah, like you, you basically you just you can't treat protein as if it were calorie free. Correct. And I think that's the interpretation some people get from those protein overfeeding studies. Yeah, definitely. Um, now, another one uh, by Cassis et al., uh, which came out, I think, this month. Effects of protein quantity and type on diet-induced thermogenesis in overweight adults. Now, what this one showed, um, you know, when people talk about protein overfeeding, diet-induced thermogenesis is, is a very important important topic that comes up. And what they found was that the magnitude of diet-induced thermogenesis did differ based on the protein dose and the protein type. And we're not talking about like soy versus whey here. We're talking about whey versus casein. Um, so, you know, these are fairly similar proteins that are both components of, of milk. So um, what, what's really interesting about this one is that we think of protein, we think, okay, there's this very fixed amount of diet-induced thermogenesis that we can attribute to it. And uh, in reality, as we probably should have figured from the outset, um, it, it's not quite that simple. It, it's going to depend on uh, the specific type of protein, the dose in which it's given, and the amino acid profile of the protein. So um, again, it further complicates this question of if we eat a shitload of protein, what happens and where might it go? Okay. Now, a third study that came out and if if I can just make a note on that, sure. I, I think that um, I think a lot of people, even folks who do properly respect science and the scientific process, do become overly fixated on means sometimes um, and don't pay adequate attention to variance. So, you know, I, I'm sure 90 percent of the people listening to this podcast, if you asked like 
you know, what is the relative thermic effect of feeding for protein? They'd probably say, eh, about 10%. But if we ask like, oh, and what's, what's the standard deviation there? Uh, I have no idea. Um, <laughs> no idea. And, and the thing is like, biology's messy as shit. And like, you know, if, if we're talking like analytical chemistry or physics, like things are pretty straightforward. Like oftentimes you can calculate exactly what an outcome should be. And if it differs from that, or if you have standard deviations, it's probably just because of experimental error or measurement error or something like that. That's not the case in biology. Like things are highly variable and it's important to note the degree of variability you're talking about. So, you know, 10% plus or minus 1%, yeah, you can probably just treat that as 10%. 10% plus or minus 7%, that's a fundamentally different thing you're dealing with. Then it's less of, okay, here is a fact that I can learn. It's 10%. That is what it is. And it moves it more into, well, this may be something I need to troubleshoot. Um, Because it could be 20%, could be 0%. Definitely. And that's actually a really good segue into the third uh, study, the third recent study on this topic that I kind of clustered together here. This one was uh, Johansson et al. And what they were looking at is overfeeding over an eight-week period. And the title of the paper is Metabolic Adaptation is Not Observed After Eight Weeks of Overfeeding, But Energy Expenditure Variability is associated with weight recovery. And so what they found was, even though when they talk metabolic adaptation here, they're talking about an increase in metabolic rate in response to overfeeding. And what they found was that as a whole in the group, there was not a pronounced effect. But in some individuals, metabolic rate and energy expenditure did go up quite a bit in response to overfeeding. And those were the people that in the washout period after the overfeeding, reverted back to normal body weight. The people who did not have a marked increase in energy expenditure tended to retain the the fat that they gained in the overfeeding period. And so um, this kind of goes along very nicely with a whole body of literature, a small body, but a body nonetheless, showing that the responses to overfeeding are very variable between people. Um, Some people, when you overfeed them, they have a huge increase in metabolic rate. Their physical activity level, their non-exercise, even subconscious activity level goes up quite a bit and their appetite disappears. These are people that defend their body weight very well in response to overfeeding. Um, And so like there's that easy thing that as a practitioner, you always lean on where you say, well, everybody's different. But no, like there are variables that have a ton of variance. I mean, it's, it's quantifiable that responses are quite different. Uh, within populations. And so to me, the question was always when we see these very applied, uh, relatively loosely controlled studies with protein overfeeding, and they're not gaining weight or fat, mostly they're not gaining fat. The question is, well, not, you know, the question is basically what could be happening when you overfeed somebody with excess calories from protein? We've always known that, sure, the energy could be used. We could be converting these amino acids to, to uh, you know, a glucose-related molecule or a ketone. Um, now there's evidence that theoretically we could make some fat via de novo lipogenesis. Um, I, I think depending on the type of protein and the doses of protein, some of it might essentially be vanishing due to diet-induced thermogenesis. And then for some people... Um, in response to the overfeeding, they might be compensating via body uh, uh, increased metabolic rate, increased activity level, and they could be under eating their prescribed allotment just a little bit because a lot of people when they're overfed, especially with high protein, their appetite disappears. So they might be saying, oh yeah, I definitely got all that food in. And I would suspect some of them uh, metaphorically have their thumb on the scale a little bit. Yeah. So um, it's just a cluster of of studies that uh, to someone may not look particularly related, but to me, they collectively kind of helped approximate a a bit of a, what's the word I'm thinking of? 
a bit of a paradox that- full frontal assault <laughs> on the dogma of being able to eat unlimited amounts of protein exactly a shot across the bow <laughs> a, f- a full-on siege complete with multiple trebuchet which are s- superior to catapults and other siege engines in every conceivable way thank you for contributing greg uh what i was going to say is a paradoxical finding in which overeating apparently didn't seem to do what we always expect it to do and so these help kind of fill in some of those gaps we can go with that too yeah (laughs) okay now another way 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 briefer research roundup uh i've just got a little grouping of two studies that came out this month now if you're an og and you've been listening to us from day one uh, the first episode, we had Peter Fitchin on for our interview, and we talked a little bit about HMB, because he had done some HMB research back in the day. Um, two studies this month, one by Trito et al., one by Texiera et al. Um, I believe that's Teixeira. Teixeira et al. <laughs> I've only left the United States two times, Greg. I mean, do you watch baseball? Not, I don't watch anything, man. Okay. I don't watch anything. There was a, there was a very good baseball player. I remember. Of, he played for the A's for a while, I think. Maybe late career. Okay. Rangers? I think he played for the Twins. All right. Well, we'll look it up. Okay. We'll put it in the show notes. <laughs> 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 but <laughs> but, uh, but no, so two studies came out. No, no need to give a, a, a lot of time or attention to them but they basically both looked at all sorts of uh forms and permutations and combinations of hmb uh with training to see how they affect hypertrophy and uh not much man not much so if you were one of the skeptics who saw enormous changes in in strength and muscle mass in response to hmb and you thought hey that looks strange there's there's a lot more evidence coming out so showing that yeah that's not uh that's not typical just as a fact check uh mark Deshera played for the texas rangers atlanta braves los angeles angels of anaheim and the new york yankees i got the rangers you did nice okay um one more study that we want to spend a little extra time on not as part of the roundup um it is called Ectosteroids as non-conventional anabolic agents. Performance enhancement by ectosterone supplements in humans. So um, let me pull up the old paper here so we can really do it justice. This is by Eisenman et al. And it was published, uh, I think it came out this month, right? Yeah, it came out like last week, which by the time you're listening to this is probably like four months ago. Um, (laughs) That's Dude, we're going to get it up in like 10 days. I know, I know. It's just, this this is currently breaking news, and by the time, by the time it gets up, the news cycle will have probably moved on, but we, we can present it as we're the ones who took a couple weeks to actually look into this, gather all of the facts. Investigative journalism. When it's actually, you know, this is still just like two days after it came out. These are actually just our hot takes, but you will get our hot takes two weeks late. That's right. So, Greg, do you want to give a, a brief overview of the uh, the setup here? Yeah. So, um, in this study, they gave, they gave people um, a supplement that was labeled to have uh, 100 milligrams of... Uh, do you pronounce the D? Is it a hard D or a soft D? Is it ectosterone or ecosterone? I think you pronounce it, but I've okay. mispronounced like seven or eight words this podcast. Yeah, so, so we're, we're going with the hard D on this one. Let's do it. Um, so they gave them a, a pill or they gave them pills that were labeled to have 100 milligrams of ecosterone uh, and 100 milligrams of leucine. And we can completely disregard the leucine because... 100 milligrams of leucine is absolutely nothing, um, or a control. And there were two groups who were given the supplement. One group was given a low dose, which was two pills per day. Um, and the other group was given a high dose, which I believe was six pills per day, um, either five or six. So, you know, both getting a 
both getting a, a look at does the supplement do what it claims to do and is there a dose response relationship here um they assess strength they assess body comp um they had people you know undergo a training program longitudinally for i believe 10 weeks and they were you know basically looking to see does this supplement do anything uh the reason they were looking at this just as some background is ecti steroids if if you're wondering what ecti means as a prefix that just means insect so ectosterone is a molting hormone for insects so as insects grow they molt um, similar to the same way like a snake would um, and so essentially these are just hormones implicated in the growth and development of insects similar to the way that uh, human sex hormones are implicated in the growth and development of humans and so they're structurally somewhat similar to um to mammalian steroids and in some in vitro research there so there there's some in vitro research i believe on mouse muscle fibers indicating that uh, ectosterone does pretty substantially increase muscle protein synthesis um so that that's kind of the background of why someone might expect this to work um, so, so that's why they were testing it. And like I said, longitudinal training study, placebo control, two different doses of the supplement. And, uh, what did they find? It, it, the stats on a study where the groups have like 10 people, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna go off road with it here. Go off script. I'm looking at charts. Okay. So findings, uh, change in body weight after this supplementation with training. Um, the placebo group gained about a kilogram. The, uh, the low dose group about two and a half and the high dose group about three. The muscle mass, the placebo group actually went down a little bit. The low dose and the higher dose increased by about 1.5 and two kilograms respectively. Everybody increased their back squat by, you know, the placebo about 16%, 18% for the low dose and about 19 for the high dose. So very, very similar. I'm sorry, those squat numbers were kilograms, not percentages. Um, Bench press uh, placebo up by about three kilograms, the low dose up by almost 10, and the high dose up by about eight kilograms on the bench press. So generally speaking, what they found was that the supplement appeared to be effective for the, the performance outcomes. They had some other performance outcomes in addition to those. Also appeared to be effective for increase in body weight and muscle mass. Now, um, probably the most notable finding was that the supplement didn't really contain much at all of the active ingredient. Yeah, and that's, I believe that's the kicker here. That is the big time kicker. So it was supposed to have, what was it, 100? 100 milligrams, yeah. 100 milligrams per dose. And what did they find per per dose? Was it like 6, six. or 12? 6. It was 6. Yeah, so when you're coming in at 6% of a labeled value, that's not, that's not great. No. Because like... To contextualize that, when I see a, a study on a supplement and I, and it, it is surprisingly looks effective, something I didn't expect to be particularly effective, my first thought is, oh boy, here we go. You know, the, uh, the old company slipped them some cash under the table. I've seen this one before. Yeah. Dude, like the company is probably not stoked <laughs> <No>. <laughs> <laughs> about, <laughs> you know, like, it's like, so basically like the, the, the real the really tricky and, and i mean it, it could have been a labeling mishap so uh, this uh the the ectosterone that they got was an extraction from spinach um something that surprises a lot of people which i think is pretty interesting is uh spinach actually has a reasonably high level of ectosteroids in it um that just kind of like illustrates the the amount of overlap in genetic stuff between kind of all forms of life on earth. I don't know what biological role ectosteroids play in the growth and development of spinach. Um, but yeah, there's, there's a reasonably high amount in, in spinach and also in a fungus called Raponticum. Um, so oftentimes if someone did want to take ectosteroid um, supplements, 
It would either be a raponticum extract or a spinach extract. And so what it very well could have been was they gave them 100 milligrams of spinach extract, which had 6 milligrams of ectosterone. But it was still mislabeled because it said 100 milligrams of ectosterone, not 100 milligrams of spinach extract. Right. And now the question is... I mean. Have they done other human studies looking at similar outcomes like this? I believe this is the first one. So we, we can't even say like, hey, can we expect six milligrams to be an efficacious dose because we don't have... Yeah, so here's, here's, here's where I get skeptical. So first things first, um, I have not seen... I've not seen pharmacokinetic studies in humans looking at like rate of appearance in blood and how quickly, like what the half-life of the supplement in in serum is. But at least in rodent studies, it seems like it has a half-life of like 10, 15 minutes. So even accounting for the fact that human metabolisms just run slower than rodent metabolisms, and maybe there's a slightly longer half-life in humans, I'm skeptical that this stuff would even stay in your system long enough to have much of an effect. Like, when you take steroids, even steroids with relatively short half-lives, for the most part, you know, a dose of something, a reasonable amount is is going to be in your system for at least a day or two. And for this, we may be talking minutes to hours. So, one, I'm, I'm skeptical that it stays in your system long enough to do much. And then two, for it to... The, the thing that makes me skeptical is the low-dose group here. So with the high dose group, they were taking, again, like five or six pills. It's, you know, 30, 36 milligrams of stuff. Um, if we use traditional anabolic oral anabolic agents that someone may take as a point of comparison, uh, you know, 30, 35 milligrams of something like D-ball or Winstrol per day, that's a reasonably low dose, but like that is a dose that would probably do something um, 12 milligrams per day, like that's, that's nothing. Um, so <laughs> looking back at the history of steroid research until like the mid nineties, the take in the scientific community was like, oh, all of these athletes are trying to use steroids, but what do you know? Steroids don't actually do anything. And the reason people came to that conclusion is if you go back and read those old studies, for the most part, they were putting people on like 10 milligrams of D-ball a day. And like D-ball works. We know D-ball works. But like 10 milligrams a day isn't enough for it to do much. Um, so when, if, if we do accept that ectosterone is like, if we accept that it works, we then also have to assume that since we did see some results with the low dose as well, we have to assume it works even better than the oral anabolics that most people would take. And we also have to assume there's not really a dose-response relationship here because the the weight changes were fairly small in every group. The squat findings were pretty similar in every group, and it didn't really seem like it helped the squat that much. Um, and then the bench findings, you know, the the uh low dose group did just as well as the high dose group they actually did a little better i think yeah, yeah so we would we would be stuck having to make the assumption that you know at low doses this shit's way better than the oral anabolics that people take but there's no dose response relationship like you plateau at a super low dose and i just find that to be really implausible assumptions that someone would have to take on board to actually make sense of these findings. Now, what the authors themselves say in the conclusion is, our results strongly suggest including ectosterone in class S1 anabolic agents. Um, so they're, they're, they're going with the idea like this is some potent stuff that needs to be managed. And um, they speculate that the mechanism of, of action pertains to binding to the estrogen receptor beta. So they're throwing out a mechanism. That they're saying, "Hey, this is a potent anabolic that needs that that warrants attention of anti-doping agencies." Um, I think you and I have concerns that certainly pertain to 
sample size. Yeah, th- that's a pretty hot conclusion to draw from a study with a sample this small. Yes. And 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 just to be clear, I'm not shitting on small sample research right now cuz I mean, longitudinal training studies are a fucking pain in the ass to carry out. Like we 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 both have firsthand experience yeah, with, it, with it that. Yeah, it cannot be overstated. So yeah. so yeah, like I'm not hating on that. Like, you know, small sample research is what it is, but you probably shouldn't draw that strong of a conclusion from a small sample study like this it's risky and you know there's all sorts of cool visualizations that show you how wonky something like a correlation can be if you just consecutively draw 10 person samples uh from a population of a thousand or ten thousand like the relationships that form and disappear just due to sampling error are are pretty remarkable like you should go go find the gif of it because it's really i just included it in a presentation down in mexico and it was people were looking at it like they couldn't believe that all these samples were coming from the same population data so yeah anytime you have small sample research again like this is one of those cool instances where the results are difficult to wrap your head around but you don't actually believe anybody's messing with you you know what i mean like yeah yeah so yeah, to, to be clear, we're not accusing the researchers of anything untoward. No, not like, at all. Because it wouldn't make sense. If you were going to if you were gonna do something shady, yeah, it wouldn't look like this. Correct. So I, I think they did everything by, you know, I mean, they did it the way it's supposed to be done. It's just weird things can happen yeah, with we're, small we're, samples. We're left with one of two uh, explanations of this. Either one... At low doses, this stuff works way better than pretty much any supplement or anabolic agent that we're aware of, but it has no dose-response relationship such that taking more of it doesn't actually help get you better results, Um, which, like, that's just wonky. Or we're seeing false positives from small sample research, which happens all the time. And... For me, evaluating those two possible explanations of the results, you know, I think just false positives are considerably more likely than the the, the assumptions we'd have to make about the potency and lack of dose response relationship to to take the results at face value. Yeah, and it, there there is some, you know, the, in everything except the bench press, generally speaking, the high dose group did a little better than the low dose but but it was not a traditional like linear dose response like you would expect yeah um another thing that should be kept in mind especially when it comes to the estimations of muscle mass is the body composition was measured using single frequency bioimpedance analysis now uh bia and bis in general have some pretty serious limitations they're basically using an electrical current to make an estimate about some type of body water, whether it's intracellular, extracellular, or uh, total body water, and then making assumptions about how that amount of body water relates to fat mass and lean mass. It assumes that the body is a series of perfect cylinders, which it is not. Um, It's actually a series of tubes. (laughs) Exactly, a series of tubes. There are all sorts of uh, assumptions baked into that cake that you have to be very generous in, in giving the equipment it doesn't make it useless but there's important limitations to consider and the fact that it's single frequency you know nowadays there are multi-frequency devices that are even substantially better than the single ones so you know th- the reason that's important is because at a single frequency you're kind of stuck with whatever that frequency current can penetrate whereas if you use a spectrum of frequencies like in bioimpedance uh, spectroscopy you can send currents that are, you know, have no ability to, uh, to you know, go through cell barriers or cell walls. Um, and then as the frequency changes, there are different, uh, there's differing abilities to penetrate different structures as it flows through the system. So when you do multi-frequency and a spectrum of frequencies, it, it allows you to make uh, a much more thorough estimate when it comes to evaluating intracellular fluid extracellular total body water and then you can use that to make a slightly more informed estimate of lean mass and fat mass so um 
perhaps I'm just drinking the multi-frequency Kool-Aid, but to me, it sounds like a much, even just theoretically, the rationale sounds a lot better to me. Yeah. Um, so, so I guess to wrap things up, it's, I, uh, I, I feel like multi-frequency BIS Kool-Aid is a variety of Kool-Aid that most people listening to this weren't even aware existed. It, it is it, it is a very <laughs> specialized form of Kool-Aid out there. Uh, <laughs> when, you, when you hit the like the medical device sales uh, conference circuit, there's a lot of people drinking that Kool-Aid, I, be, I bet. But maybe not in the fitness community. <laughs> um, so just to, just to re- recap, um, it's really interesting. It, it's a cool study. Um, I'm hoping that this will uh, encourage other research groups to follow up and say, hey, what's up with this ingredient? And uh, maybe there's something to it, but when you have limitations uh, such as a very small sample size per group and the type of device used for body comp, you have to be very cautious when interpreting it. So again, we, we don't, it's really no fault of the researchers. That's just the name of the game. And that's why we always say, hey, more research is needed. Yeah, just just for the time being, I know I'm quite skeptical, and I I think you are as well. Just don't don't rush to strong conclusions from one single study. Yeah, and and that that goes always a single study, especially when the samples you know smaller than your family. <laughs> <laughs> you, you probably shouldn't take it too far with your interpretation. Yeah. Okay, so Greg, you uh, on Monday. You posted a new article to the website all about squatting. Do you mind telling us about your new article? Yeah. So um, if you've been following Stronger by Science for a while, you know that for a few years I had like a new article about squatting maybe once every month or two. Um, We published a very thorough squat guide in 2016. And since then, like, that guide has held up pretty well um, to the point that I just haven't really felt the need to say anything else or update things all that much. Um, But recently a study was published from Kubo et al titled effects of squat training with different depths on lower limb muscle volumes. And I wanted to review this study because it, it provided more solid more solid results for two of the things that I've been saying about squatting for a while, um, based on like cross-sectional research or, or more theory that didn't quite have solid results to back them up yet. Um, so yeah, this, this gave me more like solid longitudinal findings to, to base those opinions on. So in this study, they had two groups of people, Um, One group was doing full squats, so through 140 degrees of knee range of motion. The other group was doing half squats, which was through 90 degrees of of knee range of motion. They had them train for a while, and the the main thing this study was interested in is the effects of squat depth. The main thing I was interested in is the effects on hypertrophy of different muscle groups of the lower body uh, in the full squat group. So um, the, the article itself also talks about depth somewhat, but I mostly just want to go over the hypertrophy findings in, in this little bit on the podcast since we've already gone pretty long. So um, essentially they looked at hypertrophy in the quads, in the adductors, in the gluteus maximus, and in the hamstrings. And long story short, quads grew a bunch, adductors grew a bunch, glute max grew a bunch, Hamstrings basically didn't grow at all. Um, the average increase was like a half a percent increase. Um, and so the reason that this interested me is one, um, I have been preaching the gospel of the adductors being the primary hip extensor in the squat since like 2015. Um, to this point, the strongest evidence that that was the case was one just basic biomechanical reasoning? Um, the adductor, the adductor magnus, I believe, is the second largest muscle in the body by cross-sectional area, um, and it has a very favorable internal moment arm for 
uh, hip extension when the hips are in deep flexion as they would be in the bottom of a squat. Um, and they're a monoarticular muscle. So with the hamstrings, they also have a very favorable moment arm for hip extension in the bottom of a squat. But when the hamstrings contract, that produces a knee flexion moment. So they're kind of countering what the quads are trying to do. Glutes, also a very big, very strong muscle, have a very, very unfavorable internal moment arm for hip extension when you're in deep hip flexion as you would be in the bottom of a squat. So from that, you can just kind of logically infer that the adductor magnus is probably going to be the most important hip extensor to get out of the hole in a squat. There was some modeling research by Vygotsky and Bryanton that supported that, but virtually every squat paper out there that has looked at like longitudinal effects on hypertrophy has only looked at the quads and a couple have looked at the hamstrings as well. The adductor, the, the adductors and specifically the adductor magnus just get completely overlooked. So, you know, th there was some reasoning for me thinking that it was probably the, the dominant hip extensor in the squat, but no actual experimental evidence to fall back on. Now in this study, we see very, very robust hypertrophy of the, of the adductors in people doing deep squats. That doesn't necessarily prove the full extent of my position, that they're probably the most important hip extensor in the squat, but it does at least give us very, very solid evidence that they are heavily involved in the squat and um, th that the squat does good work at targeting the adductors and causing robust hypertrophy in them. Uh, another thing I thought was interesting was the amount of glute hypertrophy um, seen in this study. So there's... So, so that may not surprise a lot of people. It didn't necessarily surprise me. But one thing to note is there was kind of a split in people who like follow the biomechanics literature about the degree to which squats targeted the gluteus maximus. The reason for that is the glutes are really, really active in full hip extension, really, really strong in full hip extension, not all that active in deep hip flexion, and also, like I already said, have an utter ass tier internal moment arm, pun intended, um, for being able to produce hip extension torque in deep hip flexion, as you would be in the bottom of a squat. So that could lead one to surmise that the squats aren't actually able to train the glutes all that hard because the most challenging portion of the squat is when you are in deep hip flexion when the glutes simply aren't able to contribute all that much and aren't all that active. So the position that the squats do target the glutes a fair amount is one, like, you know, th there is more to the squat than the hole. Once you get out of the hole, you got to get through the sticking point. And then two, even if the hardest parts of the squat aren't when the glutes have the most favorable internal moment arm, you still have to produce something approaching maximal hip extension torque to stand up out of the hole with a really, really heavy squat. The glutes are another, you know, very strong monoarticular hip extensor. Um, so like, of course, they have to contribute to some degree. And one of the things we see in some EMG research is that you get a spike in glute activation around the midway point during the concentric of the lift, which roughly corresponds to the sticking point. So what's probably going on there is, yeah, the glutes aren't really doing all that much to help you out of the hole. But then when you do hit the sticking point, the mid range of the lift, they really kick on in a big way to help you clear that sticking point. And as such, the squat does become a, an effective exercise for training the glutes and glute hypertrophy, which, again, I think that's what most people probably expected. That's what I expected, but there was a counter position to that. And to this point, there hadn't been any longitudinal research with the squat actually measuring glute hypertrophy after squat training. So this does give us solid longitudinal evidence that, yeah, squats are doing a pretty good job of training the glutes. Um... And then the last thing to note is very, very little hamstrings hypertrophy. And one of the things I've been arguing for years now is that like 
yeah, like obviously your hamstrings are involved in the squat to some degree. Um, but at least when I got into powerlifting, the common position was that the hamstrings were the most important hip extensor in the squat. I think a lot of that was based on the amount of focus Louis Simmons put on the hamstrings specifically, talking about how in a box squat you want to sit super, super far back so that the box squat essentially becomes a hamstring curl to train the hamstrings because they're the main hip extensor in the squat. Like I think that was the basic line of reasoning there. Um, but like I looked at that and I was like, no, like that that can't be the case because essentially you have multiple strong hip extensors. Uh, you have multiple strong monoarticular hip extensors in the adductor magnus and the glutes. They produce a lot of hip extension torque, don't produce knee flexion torque. They're not trying to resist what the quads are doing. Hamstrings, also very strong, can produce a lot of hip extension torque, but they do also produce knee flexion torque, so they're countering what the quads are trying to accomplish, and like obviously a squat is also hard for your quads. So just purely from a problem-solving perspective, it wouldn't make sense for your nervous system to lean super hard on your hamstrings when you have other hip extensors that can do the job. Um, and there is also, like, there's research in general on monoarticular versus biarticular muscle activation in compound exercises. And in general, what we see is that you don't get that much out of biarticular muscles until monoarticular muscles can no longer do the job. So they're kind of contracting isometrically to stabilize things, transfer force to different segments, but aren't prime movers. We say we see the same thing with the quads as well. So the vastus, lateralis, medialis, intermedius, very active in the squat, hypertrophy a lot after squat training. The rectus femoris, which is another biarticular muscle, helps extend the knee, also exerts hip flexion torque, which is not what you want in the squat. Uh, rectus femoris activation way, way lower in the squat than, say, a knee extension. And you don't see as much rectus femoris hypertrophy after squat training as you do uh, vasti hypertrophy. So, yeah, j just from a like neuromechanical perspective and just kind of thinking through the movement, one would not expect the squat to train the hamstrings particularly hard, certainly not as hard as the other hip extensors. Um, but to, to this point, I had mostly like argued from that like rationality perspective, but this study did actually measure longitudinal change in hamstring, uh, hamstring muscle volume. I dug back through some of the articles I previously cited in, in squat articles like this. Um, there were two others, one by Bloomquist and colleagues and one by Weiss which did also measure both quad and hamstring hypertrophy after squat training. And essentially, like, all three of the studies really show either non-significant or pretty minimal hamstrings hypertrophy after squat training. Um, so it's not just like this one study is a rare outlier. Um, so yeah, like, I, I feel like, I feel like it sometimes comes across as if I have a vendetta against the hamstrings. Like, hamstrings are awesome. I just want to make sure that when people are focusing on, like, what should I be feeling in the squat and what, sh like, what training effects should I expect to get from the squat, you know, expect it to be great for your quads and expect to feel it in your quads. Expect it to be uh, great for your adductors. Expect to feel it in your adductors. When we published the article... Most people commented like, well, no shit squats are an adductor exercise. Like that's the thing that gets the most fucked up every time I squat. Uh, and expect it to be a pretty good exercise for your glutes as well. Um, the, the reason that I harp so much on squats not being a particularly effective exercise for the hamstrings is I see a lot of strength athletes who do way more squat training than deadlift training, which is understandable. A lot of people do recover better from squats than from deadlifts. Um, so just kind of from an ROI perspective for your total may make a little more sense to lean into squat training. But I, I do think that a lot of lifters would specifically benefit from additional hamstrings training, like doing good mornings or RDLs. 
specifically because so much of our lower body training typically comes from squats and squats are having a training effect on your hamstrings, but not nearly to the same degree as your quads and other hip extensors. So like that's, that's the main reason I harp on the hamstrings lack of involvement in the squat so much, because like I want to be able to give people good guidance about like what other things do, do you need to focus on in your training beyond just, you know, relying on squats for lower body training. Yeah. I mean, I I remember that you were talking about the, the squat not being a hamstrings exercise. I mean, it was, it was like before we were even really friends. Like we didn't even hang out back then. It's been a while that you've been on that. Did people initially give you a lot of shit for that? Um, do you get a lot of like kickback or like fighting against that idea? (laughs) So, so what I'll say is that one, I get a lot less negative feedback now than I used to. Um, And also the ratio of positive to negative feedback has always been skewed towards positive, but the people who respond negatively to that respond very vocally and very negatively. So it's, it's a topic that I haven't touched on for a few years, just because it's always such a big fucking headache every time I do. Um, (laughs) So, so the median response is positive, but the mean is closer to (laughs) closer to neutral just because yeah there there's there's a lot of like milk toast positive responses and then a handful of like nuclear negative responses (laughs) militant hamstring activists yeah and it's like it's like dude if i'm wrong show me evidence that i'm wrong And, and the thing is like something we touched on earlier is like yeah for pretty much anything in biology like there's a there's a lot of variance between people And so I think some folks, like, they do feel their hamstrings a lot in the squat. And, like, I'm not going to call them liars. Like, I'm not making a claim that no one is hamstring reliant in the squat. Like, that would be a ludicrous claim to make. But, like, your normative, like, your personal experience is not a normative experience. Like, if squats really train your hamstrings hard, like, that's awesome. But it's also atypical which is which is fine it's just like you know if if you want to make the claim that squats are generally a good and very effective hamstring exercise for people show me the evidence like your your anecdote very strong evidence for you personally not very strong evidence for making a general claim and if you want to read more about this topic, uh, as we mentioned, that w- that article is free on the website. Do you remember the exact title so people can search it? Yeah, it's a dumb title. It's Squats Are Secretly an Adductor Exercise. Um, it's effective. But it, it talks about the adductors, talks about the glutes, talks about the hamstrings, uh, talks a lot about squat depth, which I didn't really mention here. Awesome. Um, so yeah, like it, I just hate thinking of article titles and... yeah simple ones get the job done. Absolutely. So we will also link that in the description of this podcast. Now we are out of time for this week's episode. Um, So to play us out, we we began the episode with a controversy, uh, ludicrous allegations that we were not the first fitness podcast. We put those to bed. Now I want to put another uh, nasty rumor to bed. A lot of people have been kind of indicating that greg is the co-host of this podcast and i just want to be really clear as i am every week uh greg is not a co-host of this podcast he is a uh a temporary assistant to the host and he's i i will i will admit he has been on many of the previous episodes and we currently have future episodes in the works where he will also be a guest so uh but i just want to nip that in the bud he is not a co-host is my show uh, but I'm happy to have him sometimes. Anything to add to that, Greg? Nah, not really. But you you do confirm. Yeah, for sure. Okay, okay. So I, I, I just I, I just want to I don't want this to come up again. So I, I want both I, I, of I us on record. I don't see how someone could. I don't see how someone could think otherwise. Like, why why would someone listen to this podcast and think that we were co-hosts? That it it's baffling to me. I don't know. I mean, we got people who don't get the still don't even understand that we dislike Eric Helms. They can't even get that from the podcast. So you can't get through to some people. Uh, Speaking of which, we got a great interview with Eric Helms. It was tense. It was contentious. But um, 
we had a lot of fun because we came out on top. So uh, at the uh, on the other side of the music, enjoy the interview with Dr. Eric Helms. Welcome to the Stronger by Science podcast. Uh, this is Eric Trexler and Greg Knuckles of Stronger by Science. And for the interview portion of today's episode, we are joined by the good doctor, Eric Helms. Eric, thanks for coming on. My pleasure, Dr. Eric Trexler. It's just a couple doctors having a good chat. And Greg. And yep. me. And this guy over <laughs> um, here with a beard. Greg Knuckles, as everyone knows, the intellectual lightweight. Mm-hmm. Eric, if people don't know who you are, could you give us like a very brief uh, explanation of who you are and what you're about? Sure. Absolutely. First, just big thanks for having me on, guys. It's always a pleasure. And uh, yeah, I'm just a dude who really loves lifting weights and loves the the culture, the science, the history, the experience in the community and is doing my best to give back to it. Um so I began lifting back in, uh, geez, 2004, um, and it very much became my sole focus of life. It came at a time where uh, I needed some kind of outlet, so it, it kind of served that role emotionally for me, which got me connected to it, um, and then became a personal trainer because I wanted to pursue it as a career. Um, did that for four or five years or so before starting 3D Muscle Journey with the rest of the crew. Um then it became very focused on working with bodybuilders and powerlifters. I started competing myself in drug-free bodybuilding and powerlifting in 06 in powerlifting, 07 for bodybuilding, uh, and then just pursued my academics. And if we fast forward all that to 2019, um, I finished my PhD a couple of years back, and I'm now working as a research fellow at uh, Sports Performance Research Institute in New Zealand here in Auckland, New Zealand. Um, where I have PhDs and master's students and I facilitate our uh, SNC group meetings on a regular basis. So I'm doing a lot of mentoring and, uh, and hosting of researchers, which is a lot of fun. Still doing the 3DMJ thing. I'm the R&D head there. And I'm uh, loving doing mass with uh, Greg Knuckles and also Dr. Mike Zerdos. Got a couple books. And in general, I'm just doing the science communication thing. And I still compete. So, so Eric, you... Uh you mentioned something called mass. Now, for people unaware of that, could you just fill us in on what it is and maybe give like a quick five to 10 minute sales pitch? Well, man, Greg, if you haven't heard of monthly applications and strengths for it, <laughs> you are missing out. It is the gold standard, industry preferred, personal training, strength and conditioning coach, bodybuilding coach, or athlete resource for the serious evidence-based professional. And at the low price of twenty nine ninety nine per month, you can read articles by Greg Knuckles, Dr. Mike Zerdos, Dr. Eric Helms, and watch videos of those two as well with guest contributions on a regular basis. Act now. Man, that, that is absolutely tremendous and sounds like something that everyone should check out and buy right now. Well, I agree, Greg, and thanks for having me on the podcast, and I'll see you guys next time. <laughs> I... Ever since I started working with Stronger by Science, I've had a million people ask me, how are things going with mass? And no one asked me, how are things going with Stronger by Science? Well, you know, funny story. Uh, and I, I don't remember if you were, you were with me while, while this was happening. But when we were both in Finland, Eric, uh, one of the, uh, the Finnish researchers asked me, and it could have been an English thing, but I'd like to think it's not because it's hilarious, asked me how it was to work for Greg. Um, because now I work for Stronger by Science and Greg Knuckles because we do math together. And I was like, oh, he's a great boss. You know, we have company retreats. He only <laughs> yells at me sometimes, you know, it's good. So yeah, he's been good to my family. Yes, very much. Um, so. I think at the end of the day, it's kind of like a puppet master thing. If you work in fitness, we all kind of work for Greg Knuckles in a roundabout way. Yes. He is the man behind the curtain with most things, including the academic infrastructure of sports science. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I would agree. With he that. assumes all all blame for anything that's bad and all credit for anything that's good. Yeah, it's it's a lofty position. I don't envy him, but uh, someone has to be the blame for everything. So, am am, am I just like the Bilderbergs in this in this situation? 
the dark cabal behind the scenes. Pretty much, yeah. Cool. You're the right. you're the Freemasons. You're you're the Rockefellers. You are uh, you're the ghost in the machine. You are the machine. You're not even the ghost in the machine. You're the machine. And I feel like I want to rage against you. Okay. I mean, I I can work with that. So we've already contributed a lot of really good content here, but um, <laughs> I, I want to move things in a different direction. Now, you mentioned us in Finland. As, as in, you mean a direction, basically. <laughs> yeah, and anything resembling a direction. <laughs> um, you mentioned Finland, and when we were in Finland, we talked a little bit about contest prep, mm-hmm. uh, as two body bo- bodybuilders would. Uh, you're currently in a prep, right? I am. I'm actually three weeks out as of today. Awesome. So I want to ask you a few questions about your prep. I, I don't want to do the generic like, Eric Helms, welcome to the podcast. How much protein should I eat? Mm-hmm. So I, I want to ask you some more applied questions, especially because we got you in a pretty unique time window for a bodybuilder. Yeah. Um, so this prep, um, you know, I, I've noticed every time I prep, I do things a little differently. Have you done anything differently this prep compared to what you typically have done in the past? Yeah. I mean, I've actually done a lot differently this prep and, um, a lot of it comes down to, uh, the attitude, the motivation behind it and the methodology of ensuring I'm actually in a deficit, losing fat, um, and making progress. And it's largely that I'm using a lot more qualitative indicators and I'm being less, um, I wouldn't say less structured, but I'm being less rigid in the way I use numbers and targets. Are, are you tracking your macros on a daily basis? At this point, I, I, actually, I should say no, because I'm, I'm largely focusing on protein and calories for the most part. Um, but I have only started having specific targets that I'm trying to hit for calories um, in the last two weeks. So starting around five weeks out. And that was... Um, partially just to, to feel like I am, uh, being at the low of calories, I need to be on the low days. Um, just because as you deal with a smaller number, which I unfortunately do deal with small numbers on my low days as I get leaner and leaner, um, small deviations end up being large proportional deviations, if that makes sense, uh, just mathematically. Uh, and also I think, um, Berto, uh, as is kind of guiding me into this, he's taking a little more of a, uh, a firmer role now that we're down to the kind of the final little bit of details that need to come in. Um, so I think he wants to make sure that, uh, when he's looking at changes in my body, he can associate them better with, uh, with specific quantitative changes. So he can do things like peak me appropriately or decide how long and how hard we should push given how much we have left in our time frame. Um, so yeah, for the first, I guess it was 10 weeks. Um, it was based on how hungry I thought I should be, how lethargic I thought I should be, my performance, my rate of weight loss on the scale, uh, visually what I was seeing, um, and life, you know? So if things came up where, uh, my wife asked me to eat out, I would think, all right, well, how does that affect the rest of the week for needing to be in the appropriate deficit or surplus? How would I restructure, uh, you know, our, our eating habits and when are we planning on cooking versus not? And what do I need to do to still achieve the appropriate rate of weight loss, um, while doing that? So, um, so, so you're living during prep. Exactly. You're, telling, you're, you're doing both at the same time. I think that's very well said. And, you know, just to give you an idea of how much life is going on at this time, uh, in the last five weeks, I've had four PhD students arrive um, from, which is, which is a big deal when they're doing it, you know, and moving across a couple of states in the US. But I'm talking about a, a couple from Croatia who came to New Zealand. I'm talking about a gentleman from Florida who came here. And I'm talking about a gentleman from Malaysia. Um, who have moved their entire lives. And in, in two cases, it stayed with me for a week in our guest room. I showed them around, got them set up with the bank, you know, their phone and, and really trying to, you know, ease the transition as, as an immigrant to, to a new country and get them set up as a student at AUT. Um, Wait, is it, and, is it Kedrick? Yeah. Kedrick, Kedrick Kwan is here. Uh, Colby Sousa yeah. is here. Yeah. Yeah. They're all out here, man. And also, uh, Ivan Jukic and his partner who is also going to be doing a PhD with me, uh, Katarina Pernjak. So I've got, uh, a stable of five PhD students physically located here now, and we're doing some cool stuff. 
Um, Jeez. Yeah, it's a lot of fun. It's a lot of fun. And um, literally just as of a week ago, my mom actually moved out here and she's currently staying with us while we uh, do some apartment hunting, uh, you know, try to get her set up with, you know, a car and transportation, all that stuff. Um, and, you know, I uh, traveled to Australia a few weeks back and I did uh, the first annual Sports Nutrition Australia a conference with like Sean Arendt was out there and it was, um, you know, they're basically an affiliate of ISSN, but in Australia and being able just to, to do, do that while, while prepping is something I don't think I would have envisioned even in my more flexible years. And, you know, 2011 was my last prep and I think I did a really good job, but I uh, probably couldn't have done this. This new approach, we, we kind of talked about that in Finland. Um, I remember we were talking bodybuilding and I mentioned like in, in my most recent prep, I didn't feel like dealing with the numbers day to day. So I kind of took a more qualitative approach. And the only thing I was really weighing was my protein sources to make sure I was hitting my protein target. Yeah. And I, I remember being embarrassed to tell you that because <laughs> I was like, well, I tell you what, Eric, here's a stupid thing I do. But um, but like for me, I enjoyed it a lot. I mean, d has that been it next time through do you see yourself taking a similar approach or do you think you'll go back to a more numbers driven approach well you know I, we talked about this in finland as well and i definitely didn't think it was um it was stupid or or anything you should have been embarrassed about but i understand why you were that way of us being not only bodybuilders but bodybuilders in like the super nerdy um you know evidence based little click of it where um you know, macros and, and periodization and spreadsheets are are just as much part of the uh, the ethos of our identity as as like hard work and the other things that are traditionally a uh, bodybuilder, right? So, it at that point when we were in Finland, I guess that when was that? That was uh, October. Should have been like October, yeah. Yeah, I was thinking like, all right, how am I going to do this thing? Um, and I knew that I wanted to incorporate some of the, the habit based and more qualitative stuff that I've been academically interested in and experimenting with during my mini cuts that it worked really well. But part of me was kind of like, ah, well, you can't do that for prep. And the discussion we had kind of tipped the scales for me a little bit, if I'm honest. And I was like, all right, you know, let, let, let's, let's be an adult, an adult about this and see what you can do. So I think that was a really valuable conversation. And, um, the thing about it being qualitative versus quantitative, I almost feel like that's in an experienced bodybuilder. It's not a, it's not a fair, uh, it's, it's almost like a, a false comparison because I can't not know, uh, what my, my macros, calories and protein roughly are. Um, right. Like at this stage of, of having been coaching and, and tracking that stuff on my own on and off for, for geez, uh, over a decade, um, like if you just ask me how much, how many grams of protein have you eaten today? I'll tell you. And I know that I'm probably no more than 10% off tops. Um, and same thing with calories. So it's not like I don't know. It's just that I don't have targets. Um, and, uh, and here's a, here's a useful example of where that got me in trouble. So like I said, in the last, um, two weeks or three weeks or so, I've actually had targets and there was a day where I was really, really active. I was running all, all around the city, helping a student get set up with stuff. And I was feeling super lethargic, super beat up, like my blood glucose wasn't stable. But I went, no, no, I told Berto I'd be hitting 1,600 to 1,700 calories today. I'm going to cap it at 1,700. And I woke up the next day a full kilo lighter. Um, and Berto was like, oh, what happened? And I was like, I, I turned into a traditional bodybuilder who, who ignored everything except uh, the, the number that is on high come down from, from Dorian Yates and Ronnie Coleman. And they told me you will lose your, your status as a bodybuilder in our community if you don't hit this number. Um, right. and, uh, so yeah, that was the lowest way in I've hit. I'm actually been heavier since, but look leaner. And it was just a state of being like super depleted, dehydrated. And, um, and it wasn't necessarily a good thing that I saw that number at that time. Right. Now you mentioned like that your low days get pretty low. How low is low for you for like a calorie total? Yeah. And just to put this in context, because I don't want people thinking this is normal or, or recommended for someone who competes at 180 pounds. Um, but as a guy who spends most of his time podcasting you know, or sitting at a desk, um, I, my low days have gotten down to, and again, I'm three weeks out. 
Um, I'm hitting 1600 to 1700 on my low days. And then my high days are around, they were at 2500 and Berto wanted them at 2700 because I was staying flat even after two days. So right now the basic structure is I have four lows, three highs. So four days between 16 to 1700, three highs around 2700. Um, as of late, uh, Berto's actually been doing it more like an auto-regulated uh, trigger for high days. So once I send him pictures every few days and video uh, in the same lighting, and then if he and I both agree that I'm looking tighter, um, or if I'm looking really shitty, like gross flat, uh, then we trigger those three high days. So it's basically make progress, kind of dig a hole and fill it back up. And we've only been doing that for about a week. So I'm actually right, as of today, on my eighth low day. I had one medium day in between because I had some meetings. And honestly, that's that's the biggest thing. Like I'm not I'm not negatively affected in the same ways I used to be. Like the hunger doesn't beat me down too bad. I'm not craving to the same degree. It's still there. But I feel like for whatever reason, that's something I can manage a lot better. Maybe because my diet has more variety or because I have the high days. But I get a little irritable. I can't focus as well. I'm not quite as sharp. And I don't have patience for a lot of social interaction. So I, when so when Berto told me, hey, let's go another uh, another three lows. And I'm like, oh, seven in a row. That'll take me to the S&C meeting. I'm like, hey, man, can I get a medium day today? Just because so I'm not totally depleted tomorrow from the meeting. And he was like, sure. So I got like you know, 2,100 calories and that got me through my meetings without, you know, getting fired or killing a student. So yeah. In universities these days, when you kill a student, they get so bent out of shape. It's not like, you know, the old, your grandfather's academia. Mm -hmm. So I'm mm -hmm. glad that you did that. Yeah. We, we got, we got to change with the times and it's something I've, I've come to learn. Yeah. You know, you got to accommodate the millennial mindset, but so, okay, that's not too crazy. Like I, I know my low days when I was virtually dead in prep, you know, it wasn't atypical for me to get a touch under 1500. You know, oh. I, I obviously comp compete a lot lighter than you. Mm -hmm. Um, now, but one thing you mentioned in your prep, um, I guess one of the things I like of how you phrased it is that even when you go qualitative, it's still quantitative in nature. You know yeah. what I mean? So even if you say, well, I'm going to frame this change as removing half a cup of whatever from my diet, you could frame it qualitatively, but it's still a numbers driven change. The numbers are what's doing things for you. So mm -hmm. that's, that's why I was like, you know, for me, it makes sense because my low days are really low and I'm sick of staring at the number yeah. of like, hey, Eric, did you remember you, you only get 1500 calories today? as a grown man, <laughs> I'm like, yeah. I don't want to look at that every day. So I'm like, okay, well, I'll just do some qualitative changes that are a lot easier to stomach intellectually, you know? Yes. I, and, and I, I have found that it is definitely like my stress levels, uh, my confidence, believe it or not, um, my overall disposition, um, and my ability to live life, like, you know, I, I will actively sit here and recommend that, that unless you're a highly experienced bodybuilder, you should be tracking. You probably should have a coach. Um, you probably shouldn't be eating out and not controlling your own food intake more than once a month during prep. And then I will turn around and tell you, and guess what? I'm eating out one to three times per week right now. Uh, and I'm often not in control of it, but I'm, I, I am still using quantitative numbers to ensure that um, my qualitative assessments are accurate. Like I've been losing at the rate of weight loss that I should be at. I have, um, glute striations from the sides, light glute striations from the back. Uh, and I'm three weeks out. I'm right where I should be. Um, can we, uh, can, can we get a picture of that for like the cover photo for this episode when it goes out? Absolutely. And I'm not even kidding. I, I will give you, I will give you some shreds if, you, if that's what you need, brother. Just specifically so, glute striations. That's that's all we just, want. You just want a picture of my butt. <laughs> Great. I can do that. Well, yep. I, when you put it that way, it sounds quite crass. Sorry, uh, glutes. What I, what I said is glute striations. Okay, so you want a close-up of my glute striations. C correct, yes. We're, we're on the same page now. If you watched Arrested Development, when they can't tell <laughs> if the photo is actually um, desert terrain or... A person's mm -hmm. body we want it to be ultra zoomed in glute striation done done perfect yeah and it will probably be actually the desert terrain just just for fun <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
that's a joke for the four people <laughs> in our Venn diagram of people who listen to this and also watched way too much Arrested Development. Now, you mentioned earlier that your first, I think, 10 or so weeks were not super tracked. Mm-hmm. And then the last X number of weeks were a little bit more numbers driven. Mm-hmm. Exactly how long is this prep going to be? Great question. So, you know, t- to be fair, th- th- there's a few things that if I don't put it into context, it sounds like, wow, Helms is doing nothing like he recommends. So I started my prep on December 18th. My first show is on April 6th. If you do the math, I think that's about a 15 week prep. Um, and you'll see most of the time I'm recommending six months for a bodybuilder is kind of their baseline, if not a little longer, uh, because of where most people start. Uh, but this prep truly started at least the planning stage in, uh, late 2016, where I finally saw the light at the end of the tunnel, uh, after my last data collection and after hurricane Matthew didn't destroy FAU. And I realized I would be able to finish my last uh, study, um, cause I was out in Florida for that with, with Zerdos. Um, and at that point I was like, all right, I don't need to be in the lab 60 hours a week anymore. I can actually train with the volume that I know will, will progress my body and, and have the recovery to not get broken by that. And I started training more for bodybuilding specifically. I also knew I needed to get hip surgery, which I did in early 2017 and, uh, rehab from that and then started the proper uh, off season. And I worked myself all the way up to about hundred kg or 220 pounds for the American listeners, which is the heaviest I've been since like 2000, uh, geez, late 2007. Uh, and that was just binging post show. So I got up to a peak off season weight that I hadn't been at for a long time. Uh, it, the best it ever looked, I was doing a lot more volume, a lot of more bodybuilding specific work. And then I knew that I didn't definitely didn't want to start my prep at hundred kg. Uh, so in 2018, in April, I did a one month mini cut and I got down to around 94, 95. So dropped about 10 pounds. And then I repeated that in September and then accidentally kept repeating it into October while we were in Finland. Um, so I lost about another kilo while we were in Finland, Eric, just because the, I don't know when I travel, I I just focus on, all right, I need to get my protein in. And then if you know, the, the, the food available to us doesn't really quite work. Or if it's really healthy, then I just accidentally lose more because we're on our feet. We're presenting, we're running around. Uh, you know, we trained a bunch while we were there. So anyway, I accidentally lost like another, <laughs> an, an, another additional amount of weight. So I mini cut for what, what I planned on being two four week periods and what ended up being one four week and one six week period. And then I ate up, uh, until December 18th. Uh, so I had about two months of getting myself eating as much as I could. And I, I wasn't necessarily being super quantitative there. I just wanted to feel like a regular human. And if I gained a kilo or two, then I knew that, Hey, you know, being whatever body weight I was, was probably too light. I didn't want to have any diet fatigue going into prep, but I also wanted to be as lean as possible. So I started my prep right around 88, 89. Uh, so I gained like one kilo from October to December. Um, And then started dieting at what was legitimately about 15 pounds over stage weight. Uh, And then you throw in a little extra water and glycogen loss. Uh, I will probably be on stage shredded around 81 to 83. And I started prep around 88, 89. So um, that's probably the only time I think a 15, 16 week prep is appropriate. Now that said, I don't plan on stopping after this first show. Um, So I want to compete in July. That's going to be at the Muscle Mayhem in Sacramento. We're going to have our big 10-year anniversary of 3DMJ. Uh, Jeff is planning on getting on stage. Um, And then after that, then it's kind of we'll see what's up. So I'm at least going to July, which puts me at, uh, geez, I guess that's, uh, since it's mid-July, it'll be December, January, February, March, April, May, June, July. It'll be at least eight months. And if that goes well... Uh, and I'm enjoying it and I'm not feeling like, you know, why am I doing this to myself? I might go further. There's a, a Singapore WNBF show that I might do while I'm presenting over there. Uh, if that works out, there's a local show in, in New Zealand since my mom's here now, love to be able to, you know, do that and celebrate with her here. Uh, and then hell there's WNBF worlds in, uh, in New York this year, never been in New York. And if I actually, uh, you know, still have a brain and a body by my November, I might even do that. That that is ambitious, but I mean, like like you said, if if you start lean and you do it kind of incrementally, um, hell, more power to you. Also, I mean, if the Singapore thing doesn't work out, you're there for a presentation. There's a show around. 
you could just do the presentation in trunks. Absolutely. And I think you'll give a little more credibility to what I'm saying too. Right. I mean, why put up a picture proving that you've been shredded when you can just speak in trunks? It's just my my viewpoint personally. I, right. I think uh I think that was actually like an old Paul Check thing. Uh he said if if anyone wanted to talk about like dieting or or nutrition, they should have to agree to like do it in a swimsuit. You know, and and Paul Check has always seemed super reasonable to me. I mean, well, if yeah, you're not I, I was eighty eighty percent of your time talking about poop, then you're not really a practitioner, are you? Yeah, I, I was about to clarify, like that is not an endorsement of of Paul Check generally, but sounded like uh, one. Yeah, just you heard just it here. saying that just saying that that general concept uh, isn't isn't an original idea. So uh, so Trexler probably shouldn't get too big of a head. Because really, well, he's he's not, just parroting Paul Check. No <laughs> ideas are new. You're just plagiarizing Paul Check right now. Exactly. For most of my work. Yeah. <laughs> it's true. Um, yeah. <laughs> now, I want to ask you a couple <laughs> a couple rapid fire questions and then, then move on a little bit. But a couple things that I just like to hear from other people who know what they're doing. When mm-hmm. you get later in a prep with your resistance training programming, how do you deal with, you know, generally your capacity to recover takes a bit of a hit. Do you drop volume, drop intensity, or do you try to just keep things as is? Good question. So I did a few things this prep. Um, I made myself adhere to a a deload schedule every fourth week. uh, And I had been doing it a lot more reactive in the off season, just like mainly by like when did I actually feel like I didn't want to train because that's abnormal for me and if I didn't want to train that means something has <laughs> something psychologically or physiologically is not going well and I would take a deload um, so I set up my mesocycles just based around three weeks of pushing and then one week of of deloading and then one thing I like to do uh, so that I mentally enjoy deloads and don't go into them not at all aroused to train is I do like I'll, I'll drop my my sets down from three to two, um, and I will just do one heavy set and not necessarily try to hit like a PR, but if it's there, it's there, uh, and I'll push that to closer to nine to ten RPE, um, but safely, and then I'll drop down and do some kind of high rep work uh, for the next set, unless it's a movement where that's really hard, fatiguing, or I don't want to do it because I kind of keep it in the back of my mind. The deload should be easy mentally and physically. Uh, so for example, if it's like uh, front squats. I'm not going to be like, let's do a set of 20. Just cause I'm not, cause I, I don't want to do that, you know? So that, yeah. that's one, one element of, uh, of controlling for fatigue is I have these mandatory deloads. Um, and, uh, then I've, I've been picking at the volume that is at all redundant or is the most stressful. So some things that I've done, for example, I have a day where I do a lot of bodybuilding accessory work the day before I do kind of a power lifty or a big compound movement day. And I had both dips and tricep pushdowns on that day. And I was just feeling like, God, this day's taking forever. I'm tired. I just cut out the tricep pushdowns. Um, other minor stuff that I've been doing is, for example, I was doing uh, front squats uh, and also safety bar squats. And we changed gyms and I swapped out the front squats for a power squat. And just having, man, when you're, when you're this lean, um, and you just can't figure out where the bottom of a squat is. Uh, and, and you just feel like, man, your body just feels different. Um, I really enjoyed being able to have a, a more stable environment to train that movement pattern. Um, so I've done a few things like that. I've swapped out a compound for a machine based compound and that's felt better. Um, and yeah, so I think those are the two main things I've done is just a little bit of picking it at some redundant volume and then choosing movements that feel safer when I'm this lean, uh, and then having those mandatory fourth week deloads. And there was an initial drop in volume. Like I went through, uh, two microcycles in, in prep. Uh, and I noticed I'm just not recovering the same way. I think because I started lean and because I started with a relatively aggressive deficit, but not nothing crazy, I'm still not losing faster than like, you know, the 0.5 to 1%. Um, 
I felt it earlier. You know, the kind of the old older approach I would do would be start 30 pounds over stage weight and lose a pound a week for 30 weeks. And that's just such a small deficit. Uh, and you've got such a, you know, a surplus of body fat uh, that, you know, you just don't get glycogen depleted if I had to guess, you know, and you just don't feel as beat up for a while. Um, and I wouldn't feel the need to really change my volume. But this time within two weeks, I, I noticed something. So I just cut my volume down by like, we're talking 10% globally, um, before everything. So there was a, a slight initial cut, mandatory deloads, and then picking at things to make sure that the kind of the perceived RPE globally is a little bit lower. Yeah, I mean, and that's that's an insightful answer. But you know what the problem is with you lab coat wearing eggheads <laughs> is that I preface that question by saying rapid fire round. My bad. Drop volume or drop intensity. That should have been a two word answer, Eric. You had two I, choices. I dropped volume a little bit and changed right. exercises. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, I, I like that because it's like. From someone with your perspective who does academic stuff, who coaches people, who does it in the trenches, it's good to kind of take people behind the thought process. Mm -hmm. And, you know, for things that are supposed to be rules, you know, drop volume. Well, let's contextualize that. We're talking about picking out non-essential volume. You know, we're talking about which things psychologically are a drag to do. Yeah. Um, so that, I think, you know, the podcast format is great for that. You know, it, it, those are the things that don't find their way into an article. So it's a yeah. good opportunity to get that. Um, same thing with like macros, like you should track macros, but here's what it looks like if you don't, you know what mm -hmm. I mean? And who, here's who can get away with maybe doing more lenient tracking. Yeah. Uh, and, and this is what, what what macro tracking can look like if you build that skill and not to get too meta and I'm totally destroying this whole rapid fire uh, situation with this comment. But I think my evolution to doing it this way kind of comes from a meta shift in my thinking as a science communicator and researcher where we were focused so much on the quantitative mechanisms behind fat loss, the obesity epidemic, uh, how you get lean with some almost willful ignorance and arrogance around not paying attention to not being a quote unquote victim of or needing to focus on the experience and just saying, well, look, you know, my body's going to fight me, screw my body. And I don't care about what leads to lower macros. Uh, I'm, I'm just going to have them. You know, all that matters is the numbers. I'm a machine. And I think that ignores so many opportunities for getting better outcomes by using biofeedback. So anyway, I think that has echoes across uh, my experience in the last decade, I would say. But yeah, for sure. Now, one final very brief question here. D are you doing anything to deal with reduction in NEAT or non-exercise activity thermogenesis? Or are you trying to keep a step count or like, hey, every couple hours, go take a walk around the block? Do you do anything at all for that? I did start in one, one of my first things I did when I had a stall was I instituted just two 30 minute cardio sessions that were easy. I, I wanted to keep them something that wouldn't fatigue me and then make me be even more lethargic later in the day. Cause I have noticed in previous preps that if I do hit, it just doesn't seem to like the math doesn't add up. And there is some research now that if you look at, um, it's more so in obese people, but, uh, where sometimes if you do high intensity exercise earlier in the day, TDE doesn't even go up, not in everyone, but in some, which is just wild to me. So I've been trying to kind of sneak in some formal cardio as a way to offset the, uh, the lethargy. Yeah, well, I, I would agree. Um, one of the things that I kind of went with my gut on, I'm out of the high intensity interval training game. When I'm prepping, I, Same. It, it crushes me. I'm out and there's no amount of research you could present to me that is going to convince me I should do it again. Um, yeah, I got I got scarred with that in 09, and now I just do cardio that I like. And if I'm feeling it and I want to go, like, push a sled or something, I'll do it. But I've got to be feeling it. Yeah. And kind of an offshoot of that question. So you, you're an evidence-based guy in general. Is there an approach that you advocate or implement yourself? Like, like what's the one thing you do that you kind of swear by but has the least amount of supporting evidence? Or is there anything that that you do that you're just convinced is actually beneficial that there's actually evidence against? Yeah. If, if you want to get even spicier. 
<laughs> yeah. So, so one thing I've been doing more and more lately that I could probably like, you know, after the fact justify based on some weird research is that I'll have my last or my second to last meal around like six or seven. Um, and I, for like, I'm normally good. Like my hunger between my, my first meal, my second meal, even my post-workout shake reliably goes down to something manageable that isn't distracting. And then I can wait until I'm hungry. And that normally puts me with like the three plus hours between meals that hashtag MPS is, is raised. Right. But after my last meal that I eat around seven, like my dinner, um, when I'm kind of done working and I'm not distracted for whatever combination of reasons, I'm ready to have a second dinner immediately. Um, and I almost always just, I, I basically only make it like an hour and a half, two hours and I eat again. Uh, and I'm sure the leucine gods don't appreciate that. And it, it probably doesn't make sense. Um, but it makes the diet overall much more sustainable. Like last night, uh, I had dinner and then two hours later I popped up in a can of tuna and had, and had that. Um, and I'm sure there's a, a 2007 version of Eric who's screaming about, uh, maximizing the impulse area under the curve of my MPS per day. So, but it helps. And so you're willing to stake your entire reputation on that strategy? You heard it here. My reputation staked. Is, is there anything like that you would say you think is like the thing that a lot of bodybuilders are doing wrong currently? Is there like one thing that sticks out to you that you think a, a wide range of bodybuilders could drastically improve? Yes, I do actually. And um, this is something I've talked about before, but there was that I want to say... Uh, 2013 uh, interview or questionnaire of, of a ton of bodybuilders and asked how they train. And I think uh, two thirds of them train with a once per week weekly split. Uh, and then one third of them trained with a, a still a split, but only trained twice per week. Um, and while I don't think the research on uh, frequency is nearly as convincing as say effort or volume, it's not like, I don't think those are three equal uh, influencers or, or determinants of hypertrophy, volume, intensity, and frequency. I do think that having a more appropriate frequency will probably optimize things in the long run. Uh, and I think that bodybuilders should probably be training each muscle group a minimum of twice per week. And it's interesting to me that that is the minority and no one trains anything uh, more than twice per week. Now, do you, do you think two is the sweet spot or are you, are you thinking it might even be higher than that? I, I feel like it should be the seen as the minimum um, based on what I've seen. And I think the main reason I want people to experiment with different things is not because of, again, successive hashtag spikes in, in, in MPS. Uh, it's, it's more that I think bodybuilders focus too much on the experience of a single session rather than the global management of fatigue and stress. And I spent an intentional couple years playing with upper lowers, full bodies, and splits to see how many sets per muscle group could I get in a week while having it feel qualitatively easier, even though it's more sets. And what I landed on personally was full body five days a week. And that being slightly better uh, than, than six upper lower sessions. Because I find if I can spread my, specifically my lower body compounds out over the week, each individual session gets easier and then I can pump out more upper body volume. Now, to be fair, that strategy makes sense for me specifically because I tend to have a hard time growing my upper body and my legs look pretty good on lower volume and tend to be a little bit larger on balance. So that might not make sense for someone uh, who is, you know, uh, top heavy. Um, they might need to be, uh, take a different strategy. But for me, like I, I go in there and I have one main lower body compound lift per day, or I have one day where I just do calf raises. Uh, and then I just do a lot of upper body volume. I get way more total work done per body parts that need it. And I feel much more recovered. And that has been really nice during prep to, to not have to go great. I have leg press, RDL, leg extension, leg curl, and calf raise today. That sounds that sounds really not doable. It's like, oh, I have safety bar squats, and that's it. Yeah, and then I can move on to yeah, I can move on to lateral raises. I can move on to chest press and and uh, stuff that that is more fun for one. Um, 
and that you can, you know, see yourself looking awesome in the mirror, uh, which, which is, is as silly and narcissistic as that is. Like one of the saving graces I find motivationally uh, when you get to a certain point in prep is training with less clothes on in a gym with good lighting and mirrors. Because then you can look past the fact that you feel lethargic uh, or that maybe your weights have gone down slightly and be like, man, this, this is a lot of fun. I look great. And then you kind of forget the fact that you were only thinking about pizza an hour ago. So you you preface that by saying you think that uh, frequency probably isn't as important as something like volume, specifically for muscle growth or intensity for strength gains. Um, but so with, with anything like that, the thing that I the thing I always wonder is uh, when we look at research, even meta analyses on studies that run, you know, eight, twelve, maybe sixteen weeks, is I wonder if if things that seem to be better in the short term actually work out to larger benefits in the long run. So, for example, mm. um, have can you think of any examples that you personally know of of someone who, you know, had already been lifting uh, 8 to 10 years, already gotten quite big, seemed to be either at or close to their quote-unquote, like, genetic limit, who then, like, changed training frequency and gained a notable amount of additional muscle or a situation like that because the thing i wonder is like you know maybe these things are better for like making gains faster and maybe like you eventually hit a plateau in you know six years instead of 10 years but you're kind of winding up in the same place regardless like does that make sense it does make sense. And the short answer is yes, I've definitely seen that. And that's actually a relatively common experience with some of our clients. Uh, and this is actually a relatively uh, common experience I've had when I can convince a bodybuilder to give it a shot and try it for a while. Um, the thing is, is and to get kind of into the mindset of a bodybuilder, and I know Eric, you'll appreciate this, it's, it's very difficult to have a session that, is, that has a moderate feel. And what I mean by that is if you look at the dominating paradigms of training and bodybuilding, you either have failure and post-failure training, kind of the Dorian Yates-esque approach, uh, which forcibly limits you to, to your, your volume and your frequency, or you have the marathon sessions where uh, you are sweating, you are burning. Uh, if you think of kind of the clips from pumping iron, there probably is a little bit of failure in there, but there's drop sets, there's giant sets. You're doing a lot of work. And there's very little promotion of anything in the middle, um, like, but it's been around, but it just doesn't gain popularity. Like Brian Haycock's HST. That's a great example of uh, what is kind of was, was evidence-based at the time where you go, right, well, we're going to take the volume that you do on any single day uh, and then just spread, spread, it out, spread it out over three full body sessions because that makes the most sense based on the evidence. And this has been around since the, the early 2000s. Um, with some great examples of people who've used it successfully, but, but it's never caught fire. And the reason it didn't catch fire is it doesn't align with the ethos that bodybuilders have in their brain, uh, which is it's all about hard work. There's got to be a healthy bit of masochism and each session needs to feel hard. And it's very difficult to enjoy your training if that's not the case. So I think for me to, when I try to sell someone on this, I've stopped f focusing on, hey, have you read uh, Greg's uh, open access meta-analysis on Stronger by Science on Frequency? I, I stopped taking that tact you and I start taking, well, it's in there. It's in there, but only if they're super <laughs> nerdy. The, uh, but the, the main convincing factor is I go like, I try to get them to start focusing on their logbook more because it really starts to pay off in terms of their strength levels become much more because their recovery is a little more homogenous. They can push harder. Their training lifts more frequently so they can, they can reap the rewards in their log books a little more. So kind of, and th that is something that's gained popularity ever since like DC uh, came on the scene when people are like, Oh, let's beat the log book. Let's beat the log book. So the more quantitative bodybuilder who enjoys seeing progress uh, and can convince themselves, well, I must be working hard enough because I am progressing my lifts uh, tends to do pretty well with this approach um, because they don't psych themselves out. They don't feel like, man, this is easier than anything I've ever done. Um, so I think, I think, yeah, it's, it's one of those things that I have seen it work quite well. 
Uh, and I've probably been able to sell it to people just on the fact that, hey, I'm a 3DMJ athlete now. I want to be part of the crew. They all say it's good. And now I believe in it. So uh, obviously, it's not like an RCT. But I've seen it time and time again be effective in high-level athletes who've tried going from a once-per-week split to more. Um, and one final comment on that before you chime in is that I've seen a lot of people get net worse results because they don't understand how to moderate individual sessions. They'll go from training on a, a Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday split, your standard bro split. And then they'll switch it to like legs, chest and back, shoulders, arms, six days a week. But they'll keep the amount of volume per muscle group the same per session. So they basically double their volume and then they get wrecked and they go, yeah, that was too much. You can't recover. I'm going back to once per week. Uh, or they keep going to failure. So it's it's one of those things where they're unwilling to compromise on the whole reason that bodybuilders train once per week is that they take each session to the house. And if you don't take it all the way to the house, it allows you more frequency and it might be better uh, in aggregate. But if that's a non-negotiable, then you're never going to see that. Now, that's a, a perfect segue. So you're mentioning bodybuilders. There's that kind of masochism tied into it, you know, mm -hmm. especially late in prep. It gets a little bit a little bit gritty. Um, I recently found myself in the hopefully metaphorical crosshairs of a fitness industry influencer. I was talking about bodybuilding and, <laughs> and they said that I was a shitty person because I had not forcefully condemned the, the practice of bodybuilding and used the term physique athlete, suggesting that bodybuilding was a sport. Mm. So as a person who's been in the bodybuilding game forever, what is your comment or your kind of response to people who say bodybuilding's unhealthy, you know, it, it is essentially a competitive eating disorder, it shuts down your, your body when you prep? What, what do you say to people who kind of kick back against bodybuilding and say it's a pursuit that people ought not pursue? You know, first, I, I would say I really understand where you're coming from to that person and that it can, it definitely can be all those things. Um, but something that can be a certain way is not the same as something that is inherently that way. Um, an eating disorder is an eating disorder. A, um, you know, masochism is masochism. Bodybuilding can lead to eating disorders or exacerbate them or might attract people with them and can have masochistic elements, but they are not the same. So what I think that means is that we need to have a little more nuance and care and also consideration in the way we talk about bodybuilding, which I absolutely agree with. Um, and these days, I am much more a fan of someone becoming a quote unquote lifestyle bodybuilder. Um, cause I think we almost say like recreational lifter with derision, you know, um, if someone is trying to look at it, to figure out what's the leanest physique that they can maintain without, uh, any kind of negative effect without being in a state of low energy availability while also having built the most muscle mass, they appreciate that look. There's an artism to it. There's empowerment. Uh, and, uh, that truly I think is healthy because they're not in a dieted state. Uh, and they're trying to build symmetry and they're kind of a throwback to the, the kind of the Grecian ideal and they're appreciating the symmetry and proportions. They see their body as art. I think there's a lot of really cool things in bodybuilding that don't require you getting on stage. Um, now, if you do decide to compete in that and take it even further, I think it's just the same as any other sport in that there is a trade-off between health and performance. Now, just like, again, any other sport, the the range of those trade-offs spans from, uh, you know, natural bodybuilding and competing in one of the divisions that doesn't require quite as much leanness, uh, all the way to, I'm trying to get, uh, an, a Mr. Olympia win in, in a bodybuilding class, uh, where I am going to be okay with trading a couple decades of my life and needing to be on HRT for the rest of my life. Um, if I, and, and, and maybe not having kids and stuff like that, uh, on the other side of it. And, um, and yeah, I think the, the answer is that we just need to be very clear with the potential risks. Like, I mean, you could say the same thing about gymnastics, where if done in the way that results in optimal performance, we're hopefully stunting puberty in, in, in small 
gals at a young age were recruiting children uh, when they don't necessarily have the agency or the, the legal consent to really say they want to compete in this. We're encouraging them to suppress their energy intake. And then we're while we're doing that and potentially inducing a loss of uh, you know bone mineral density via nutritional and hormonal factors, we're then going to slam them as hard as we can into the ground uh, and just hope they don't get a stress fracture and then tell ourselves that the fact that they have this high impact training is offsetting the fact that we've suppressed their their natural maturation but that's fine well for for something for something even less extreme cuz like you know you, you bring you bring kids into it and and automatically then you're dealing with more like well do they understand what they're doing etc mm-hmm. but even for something less extreme than that um like endurance sports, like elite endurance sports for female athletes. Also, like even if they're old enough to know what they're doing, you see a lot of amenorrhea. Uh, yes. You see a lot of stress fractures. You see not all all the time, but often you see like a pretty big loss in bone mineral density even before menopause. So mm-hmm. like, yeah, you're you're also dealing with a lot of issues there as well. But people don't demonize that, N- nor do I think they should. I think people should... Before they do something, they should know what they're getting themselves into. And if they know what they're getting themselves into and they want to do it, sure. Like, be my guest. I don't care. I I totally agree. And with that said, I do I do really think that that bodybuilding as a competitive endeavor that you stick with for your life, um, it is among, if not the uh, highest potentials for having a negative uh, some negative negative effect, at least temporarily, maybe early when you first started competing or or something that becomes kind of cyclical. Um, and those who stick with it long term typically figure out a way to make that not the case. So I wonder how much survivorship bias we see. Um, and I, I mean, maybe, maybe it's true of any aesthetic sport that requires uh, you to kind of really always be focusing on your nutrition in a way that is uh, not the way humans would like to focus on their nutrition, which is, you know, culture, connection, uh, emotion, uh, and sustenance, but always about kind of monitoring it and focusing on more on external cues. I think the fact that uh, your quote unquote practice comes home with you all the time and each time you step in the kitchen really makes aesthetic sport as overall and especially bodybuilding uh, have a higher potential uh, harm. So you really need to go in with eyes wide open. And I'm all about convincing people to be a bodybuilder who doesn't necessarily get on stage. And only if you were truly have the calling and it's just something you really want to do and you understand it, should you do it? But I really think the sport is for a very small minority of, of crazy people, um, that I'm proudly a part of. Yeah. I mean, I, I echo your guys' sentiments. I I've done studies on gymnasts. Good luck finding a 22 year old gymnast that doesn't have at least one surgery scar. And, Mm -hmm. you know, I've done research on retired football players. They die younger than people that didn't play football. You know, I mean, it's to echo what you guys have said, it's, do you know what you're getting into? And I like the, you know, Eric, you mentioned with, with natural bodybuilding, you can adapt your approach and, Mm -hmm. and find a way to interact with the sport in a way that isn't just neutral to your health, but actually a positive influence to your health. Um, whereas yeah, so that's actually a really good point, Eric. I think that's something we, there was a study that just came out of Finland again, to keep talking about our, our time there, uh, nostalgically where they showed the, the overall like heart health of a bunch of gals who went through contest prep there was markedly improved, even though they started at a BMI and activity level that was well within and past the health recommendations. So, so by getting uber lean and doing more uh, exercise training that was already reaching the standard, their heart got even healthier, uh, at least by the the, 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 me- the metrics they use. So it's it's not like contest prep automatically crossed the board black and white bad for you. Um, but I think you're 100 percent right. Um, it it can be a healthy endeavor, especially if you're doing it drug free. Uh, and we shouldn't ignore that, even though it does potentially come with, um, you know, just at least at least temporary disordered eating um, during during contest prep or immediately afterwards. Yeah. And I mean, I, I love the way you talk about bodybuilding. I mean, it's it's part of you now. Um, so the, the thing I couldn't help but but <laughs> I mean, when I heard I was a shitty person for promoting bodybuilding, I was like, dude, they need to have like a U.N. war crimes tribunal for Eric Helms. 
Uh, if promoting right. bodybuilding makes you a bad guy, you are like one of the sickest people on the planet right now. Um, I'm pretty much a, a uh, like a Chechenian uh, war criminal who is who slaughtered children. Yeah, you are the worst of the worst. Now, yeah. and you you have a a podcast now where you kind of talk about um, like lifting culture, right? Do you want to plug that real quick? Yeah. So to kind of dovetail off of this, I think. Maybe one of the reasons why I'm not quite uh, Slobodan Milosevic is because I look at bodybuilding with a bigger lens than what is the current culture of bodybuilding. Um, when I say I love bodybuilding and I, I appreciate it, um, there's a lot of people who don't relate to the way I relate to bodybuilding who are very high level competitive bodybuilders. They don't feel like it's art at all. Uh, they're not interested in the qualitative experience. They do look down on people who are quote unquote lifestyle bodybuilders. Uh, they think if you're going to use that title, you better be getting on stage and they compete to win and it is their life. And if you're not doing it that way, you're not hardcore. You don't really deserve your bodybuilder card. But I really appreciate the art, the history, um, the ethos it came from, from physical culture, uh, some elements of the Grecian ideal, although not directly related to it. And those are all things that we explore in Iron Culture, which is a podcast that myself and Greg, uh, Greg Knuckles, that's hilarious. Um, that's not the person that Omar Isaf started with me. Well, I mean, ultimately, um, I'm, I'm, the, I'm the person behind the scenes. Yeah, it's right. true. We're, we're, we're all Greg Knuckles. Uh, I am Knuckles, is I think that uh, anyone who watches Walking Dead will get that joke. Um, so, yeah, uh, Iron Culture, it, we, we take a a holistic look at lifting culture from a societal, cultural, uh, historical, and scientific perspective. So as an example, we had on uh, Dr. Mike Zerdos, uh, Mike Tushir, and John Kiley to talk about autoregulation and periodization for two hours. And then we also had on uh, PH Deadlift, Ben Pollock, the strongest freaking 93 on the planet, uh, who got his uh, doctorate in physical culture and sports studies, and his colleague, uh, Dr. Don Moraes both just to talk about the history from the 1700s to the 1900s of early lifting in the West. Uh, and then we've also had uh, John Meadows and Dr. Mike Isratel to talk to uh, us about a uh, frank and honest conversation about steroids. So it's it's just life decisions, culture, history. Uh, we've got a lot of cool episodes coming out. So it's very much trying to create unity and awareness of the depth and the richness and the issues, uh, both contemporary and historical uh, in lifting culture. Awesome. So if you're listening, go ahead and check out um, Eric's podcast. It sounds like they have a, a wide variety of really interesting topics on that. Um, Eric, thanks so much for, for coming on with us today. We really appreciate your time. And if people want to get in touch with you, uh, how, how can they reach out to you? Hey, a huge pleasure. And I'm really glad you guys have a podcast because I love listening to you both talk. Um, and thanks for having me on. So yeah, if you want to learn more about me or what I do or read or listen or watch my stuff, go to 3dmusclejourney.com. That's the best one-stop shop. You can find links to mass. You can find links to my book. You can find links to the 3DMJ vault where we do our courses for bodybuilding and powerlifting. Uh, and you can also find uh, links to our podcast and our blogs, which I'm on regularly, the 3DMJ podcast, the other one I do. Um, so you can get all of our free content. You can get access to the paid content if you want to go that route. And then in, in, the only things that aren't there uh, is my Instagram handle, that at, that's at Helms3DMJ, and then Iron Culture Podcast, which you can find on iTunes, Spotify, and YouTube. Excellent. Well, we're about to sign off. Thanks, everyone, for listening. Thanks again to Eric Helms for joining us, and we will see you on the next episode. Thanks for listening to the Stronger by Science podcast. Now, Greg and I are not experts in medicine or health or really anything else for that matter. So before you make any changes to your diet and exercise habits, make sure you check with a doctor or another healthcare professional. If you enjoyed this podcast and you'd like to support it, Visit StrongerByScience.com to check out the products and services that we offer. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next time.